This podcast is created for adult audiences only and contains content that may be alarming to some viewers. Listener discretion is advised. Any badass views or opinions you're about to hear are those of the hosts that do not represent those of the people, institutions, or organizations that the podcast may or may not be associated with. So just don't be a dick. You know what you're getting yourself into. All right, hello weirdos and welcome to Girls Gone Weird. We are on episode six, so thank you so much if you have hung with us this whole time. That's super awesome. We really appreciate it. How are you doing tonight, (laughs) Dinny? I am nervous as fuck, to be honest, about this case. See, Nicole's normally very nervous about like paranormal Mm -hmm. stuff. I'm more nervous about the living, so I'm very nervous about this one. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have some pitchforks at your at your door after this one. Maybe it don't come at me. (laughs) (laughs) Don't shoot the messengers. (laughs) Don't shoot the messengers. No, today we're gonna do a big case. Um, it's very, um, it's one of these ones where everyone has an opinion that is so strong and there's hundreds of facebook groups there's multiple Mm -hmm. protests about this not to mention this is just a doozy of an episode it's a long one so if you need to split it up that's fine but there was a lot of ground to be covered what we are doing today and that will go into the avery case and obviously you knew that if you read the podcast but we want to make sure that we do this right and i promise we will get to try our best Yeah, this is a case that the whole country got fired up about all at the same time. It was insane, so. Including me. Did you watch it right away? Uh, I did. Making a Murderer when it came out on Netflix? Yeah. I watched it right away. I watched season two right away uh, Mm -hmm. with my husband. And yeah, we were just, we were in it deep, just like everybody else. It's been a while. So, and you know, after things have gone on so long, like, they just kind of peter out and you kind of forget about it. So I'm glad that we're going through it all again today um, because... Exactly. Yeah. And because I don't know if anyone knows this, but I believe a lot of people probably know this case and are in true crime probably do, but there is a documentary that just came out called Convicting a Murderer. Um, the first two episodes are on YouTube for free and then it is on the Daily Wire platform. But I think that's Mm. making people... Yeah, right? Mm. We'll talk about that. But um, (laughs) that's making people a lot more um, interested in kind of both sides of the case and learning about it. So have you watched all the episodes yet? I haven't. So I started Mm -hmm. them, and then I could... The Daily Wire app was not cooperating with me. I think it knew Mm -hmm. that um, I was liberal scum, and it just did not want to play the rest of the episodes for me. It's like, who is buying this app? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, it is on my list to complete. So n- nobody shoot me for recording this episode and not being fully informed. <laughs> Denny is well, informing no us problem. all. <laughs> I am. And you don't even have to watch it if you don't want. But we'll go through it. I will try to tell a little bit about each. My goal here is to tell um, about making a murder, about convicting a murder, and actually go through the facts of it. And we're not here to change anyone's minds, right? We're not here to place make someone have a different opinion. Right. We're just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. giving you the facts. And if we do place an opinion, that's our opinion. Fuck off. <laughs> it's ours. Yeah. Fuck off. Don't be a dick. Says it in the beginning. <laughs> you know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> yep, you know what you're getting yourself into. So before we start, we do want to put a trigger warning on this. Um, there's a few. There's violence against women, and then there's also a lot of talk about rape. Um, there also is a few mentions of animal cruelty. So if those are three things that might trigger you or make you uncomfortable, just go to a, another fun episode of ours. Yep. So shall we start? Let's do it. Awesome. Let's do it. Do it, do it. So, Making a Murder was a Netflix true crime documentary that was released in December of 2015. Now, during the holiday of 2015, this documentary was like what everyone was talking about. Um, In the first month alone, it had 19.3 million views and gained a large audience, including celebrities like Alec Baldwin and Ricky Gervais. I don't know what you were doing when this came out, but everyone was on social Mm -hmm. media talking about Mm -hmm. it. Same. 
I know I was. It gained countless awards, including six Emmy nominations, with four wins, including Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Series in 2006. As of now, it has an approval rating of 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's one of the best documentaries that has been put out um, by how it is rated. Now, the series was written and directed by filmmakers Laura Bacardi and Myra Demos. Um, I will say, as always, I apologize if I say last names wrong. Now, the show tells the story of Stephen Avery, who's a man from Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, who served 18 years of a prison sentence for wrongful conviction due to a sexual assault and attempted murder of a Penny Bernstein. Now, this documentary chronicles Stephen Avery's life from 1985 to 2007. It portrays his wrongful conviction in 1985 and his exoneration in 2003 to the help of the Innocent Project. Now, in October of 2004, he filed a $36 million lawsuit against Manitowoc County and county officials associated with his conviction. So this is when the bombshell hits this documentary and made it kind of go boom. Mm -hmm. So the same county that locked up this man, Stephen Avery, for 18 years for something he didn't do, whom he has a multi-million dollar lawsuit against, seems to frame him for the murder of a young woman named Teresa Halbach. Now, this documentary continues to take this man, Stephen Avery, who comes off as a gentle teddy bear and shows him and his family go through the suffering of another trial that seems similar to his first wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. Along with Stephen Avery, his 16-year-old nephew, Brendan Dassey, is interrogated by police and admits guilt to being accessory to murder. This caused another bombshell in this documentary as well because it shows Brendan who is a young man with an IQ um, that has been told to be in the borderline deficiency range, being coerced into a confession, sealing his fate. So this series covers the arrest, prosecution, and conviction of Avery and Dassey, with Avery receiving life in prison with no possibility of parole, and Dassey receiving life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2048. So... This documentary really did cause an uproar because it was seemingly showing two victims. They were being targeted by the police system. And I, I know that, you know, being from Minnesota and what we have seen in the police system and, you know, continuously seen in our country, it really did pull to our heartstrings of us that, you know, have felt prosecuted by police, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it created, you know, the hundreds of Facebook groups to free these men. There was protests and there was even a 500,000 signature petition to the White House. Even Kim Kardashian got on board and tried to help Brennan Dassey mm -hmm. get out. <laughs> so it was truly a phenomenon. So almost three years later, a second season of Making a Murderer was released in October of 2018. Now this season gives updates on the case and chronicles Kathleen Zellner, a defense attorney famous for overturning wrongful convictions. Now, by the end of Making a Murder Season 2, neither Brendan nor Stephen had been exonerated, but it does show the famous Zellner claiming new evidence and going to the courthouse to prove their innocence. Now, anyone in the right mind would watch these award-winning documentaries and feel like justice was not served. They did an excellent job at pulling our emotions and really creating a you know, flowing narrative. That's why it was so popular. Mm -hmm. So how did you feel when you first watched it? I think like a lot of people, when I first watched it, I was on board with, holy shit, how did this happen? They are victims. They are innocent. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't the greatest man on earth, but he, you know, they did him dirty. Like, it's insane. Mm -hmm. um, I was very much on the side of that all of the police evidence looks super shady. It looks planted. It's messy. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it was... A popular opinion you know uh, but yeah there were definitely cracks in the story that make you kind of like not sure completely so so yeah I don't I don't even know where I fell at the end there yeah when Mark and I watched it we were just like how could this happen um, this is crazy just like everyone else they did a great job making that documentary and really creating that narrative for sure it's why it was so popular so for me, years later, when Stephen Avery's mom, Dolores Avery, passed away, someone I knew on Facebook named Christine Franson wrote a Facebook post about her, like a nice memorial. I commented 
on there about how terrible it was for their family that she wasn't able to see her son and her grandson free this is when she she hit me christine with another bombshell that my reality that i learned from this documentary like we all had about this family was just an extremely well-crafted documentary but you know not actually reality so we'll go into that a little Mm -hmm. bit more so Today's episode is special because we're bringing you an interview with someone who worked very closely with this case named Christine Franson. I know Christine through our work with animals and our work in the LGBTQ community here, Mm -hmm. Um, but she is also known in the documentary that just came out, Convicting a Murderer as an Avery Supporter. So Convicting a Murderer is a new documentary that came out this year, and the main goal is to hold documentaries accountable and maintain integrity. So documentaries are supposed to be factual, and as a society, we typically trust them. But in this case, Convicting a Murderer documents how the creators of Making a Murderer withheld evidence from the public, created false evidence, and downright used creative liberties to turn a possible villain into a hero. So again, I'm not here to tell you what you believe, but that was the narrative Mm -hmm of convicting a murderer. So Christine worked closely with the Avery family, the person we're going to talk to today. Um, She created Avery support groups, and she also became close with Kathleen Zellner to help exonerate Avery and Dassey. Um, Her main job was like doing public relations and support. So when our podcast episode releases here, um, eight out of 10 episodes of that will be out by the time it's completed. So you will see this person go on the documentary from someone who is an avid reporter to someone that starts questioning. So today's podcast, we're not going to change anyone's minds. We're not going to promote making a murder, convicting a murder, and we're for sure as hell not going to promote the fuckery over at Daily Wire. <laughs> um, we are here to share the story of this amazing woman named Teresa Halbach, who has really been forgotten in this case. We also want to show how weird And super fucked up it is that we have created a society where we have focused on what we believe is the truth and we trust things like documentaries and news outlets to give us facts. And that's all we want. That's not necessarily just want some fucking facts. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I was I even wrote on here how I see it is we're kind of living um towards the movie Idiotocracy. (laughs) Have you ever seen that movie? Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So before we get into our interview with Christine, uh, Nicole and I do want to do just a quick run through of the case facts in case you're not familiar with the case or you just need a quick touch up. Um, I will try my best to incorporate the sides of making a murder, convicting a murder, but I also am going to just say case facts in here too. Uh, But first, we want to talk about the actual victim here. I mean, I feel like for everybody, the Avery family is what immediately comes to mind when anyone even mentions making a murderer. But, you know, who doesn't? And, and that is uh, Teresa Halbach, the fucking victim. And this is somehow, like, all about her and not about her at all, you know? Mm-hmm. Which is fucked up. It's very fucked it's up. It's so fucked up. And her poor family, too. Like they, like, they have not done a ton of interviews. They try to just, they're pretty tight-lipped. They're just trying to fucking move on. And here we are with our podcast. <laughs> I know. I I know that they have also, when that came out, because it was looking like, you know, they were on the side of not caring if, you know, because they made it seem like, you know, they're, you know, innocent, but yet mm-hmm. they're still pushing to get these innocent people in jail because they're looking for justice. And because mm-hmm. of that, they had a lot of people come at them, too, which yeah. is sad. It's almost mm-hmm. like they were victimized twice. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, so it it's is ridiculous. Um, And that's exactly why I want to start this episode sort of by letting everyone know a little bit more about Teresa, the young woman in the background of her own murder investigation. And unfortunately, unlike the former, the Avery clan, there is not much history on this young girl available. And I'm sure a huge reason behind that is because of how short her life was cut, Um, but also just because of the mass media surrounding this case. I mean, the minute you Google her name, everything about the Avery has come up. You know, mm-hmm. you have to sort through pages and pages to find anything just about this girl and her life. Um, so I was able to pull up what I can so we can sort of try to honor her a little bit. So, yeah. So let's go into Teresa a little bit, our victim. Uh, she was born the second of five siblings in Wisconsin in 1980. And she grew up on a dairy farm near Green Bay. She graduated from Hilbert, a rural country high school with less than 200 students in Calumet County uh, between Lake Winnebago and Lake Michigan. Um, and I don't know about you, we both live in rural areas, and every time I say rural, I think of that, is it the, 
<laughs> the rural juror. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, rural rural juror. Juror. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounds like a mar- mouthful of marbles, and I just trip over my tongue. <laughs> the rural country high school. Well, you know me. I make up words all the time, so... <laughs> That's it's your true. turn. <laughs> I, on that note, I made I made up a word in the last episode, and I'm wondering if you remember what it was. I made up mm-hmm. cryptoid. <laughs> I kept saying cryptoid instead of cryptid. <laughs> I said it first, right the first time, mm-hmm. cryptid, and then I kept saying cryptoid, cryptoid. Mm-hmm. Like, what the fuck is a cryptoid? Anyway, <laughs> making up words. Rural. <laughs> she no was problem. a rural gal, just like we are. Um, mm-hmm. So she had a, a friend named Kelly, um, and they were friends since preschool. And she had said that Teresa was just a really energetic and spontaneous person, that they were always up to something, and she was outgoing, brave, like a happy-go-lucky typical Midwestern girl with an electric personality who just loved karaoke. Uh, She loved to jam out to No Doubt, because who does not like to jam out to No Doubt? Uh, The Beatles and Sheryl Crow, typical 90s stuff. Um, Her friends and her mom talked about how infectious her smile was, and she just had a zest for life. Uh, and a desire to be a mom someday. Uh, She had a really tight-knit family, but was especially close with her younger sisters. They would go shopping and watch movies and just get together a lot. It was really sweet. Um, And she even coached her little sister's volleyball team in the summer, which was sweet as well. Um, There was actually a story I read about a camping trip that she took with one of her friends. And at some point, (laughs) at some point, her friend noticed like a huge rip in the tent and she got all worried that somebody was like tried to break into their tent at night and like rip it open so she like nudged at Teresa all freaked out and Teresa told her that you know it was nothing she said she had to go to the bathroom and couldn't find her way out of the tent so she clawed her way out (laughs) (laughs) just like can't find the zipper just just (laughs) big footed her way out of the tent that made me laugh when I read that and then they just patched it up with duct tape the next day (laughs) um but she just really seemed like a cool chick with a lot of gumption and she just didn't give a shit about clicks or popularity or all that stuff and she was just a solid like good person which there's really not a lot of these days I mean there is but like so many people have ulterior motives and especially when you're that young you're blinded by society and capitalism and just all the bullshit and she just seemed like she had a good head on her shoulders so you know every time i hear anything about her or like see pictures of her i'm like i feel like she'd be she'd be a cool friend i feel like she'd be someone totally to you can see it in her eyes she had these right? big beautiful brown eyes just mm-hmm. like you actually <laughs> um mm. and yeah you just i don't know i i see a really sweet girl when i look at her picture mm-hmm. um and I'm sure you're aware there's this bittersweet but like slightly chilling video diary she recorded three years before her murder um, where she talked about her dreams and her death which was really weird like really? not many people <laughs> do video diaries about about their death I know it wasn't about her death but she mentioned it and then she's murdered three years later like Jesus Christ and we will post the link to the diary in our probably in our story and maybe just do a little screen recording of it um, that we'll put in the post for you guys to check out Um, but here's a little blip it that she said in the diary she said let's say I died tomorrow I don't think I will I think I have a lot more to do I just want people that I love to know that whenever I die that I was happy and that I'm happy with what I did with my life Uh, she said in the diary that she wanted to be a mother because that's the one thing I've always known that I want to be as a mom uh, but there's a reason for everything, so and I will be a good mom one day. I will, as long as I'm happy. Uh, she also said that she was religious and loved God, and she was positive and loved to travel and loved to give people compliments and loved to make people laugh. Uh, she said, I love knowing that I like who I am. I love taking pictures. I love holding a camera in my hand. I love kids. I love babies. I don't hate anyone. I love a lot of people, and I feel loved. So... It's so bittersweet. Ah. Oh, <laughs> it's hard to watch the video. You can tell she's mm-hmm. like it wasn't rehearsed. She was just speaking from her heart. She's sort of like her eyes are wandering around the room and she's thinking about what she's saying. And it's just it's little. It's definitely spine tingling when you watch it. Um, yeah. But yeah. So she, I mean, she so she mentioned she liked to travel. And while she was in college, she traveled to Mexico and Spain Um, And she even studied abroad in Australia, where she learned to scuba dive and took some dips in the Great Barrier Reef, which, if you remember, I did as well. I did that as well. Um, Briefly, I went into the Great Barrier Reef, and it 
is boring. Let me tell you. Oh. <laughs> it uh, our our planet is killing the reef. So, in pictures. Oh. <laughs> Boring. boring. In pictures, you see it's all like colorful and beautiful and magical. Oh, there's like not much there? Yeah. No, it's like brown and gray. And like there's some cool fish. Uh, and we I actually didn't scuba dive. I snorkeled. But still, it was like it was not not as exciting. And that's just because we killed the planet. That's all. Wah, wah. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, her previous boyfriend said that she was a friend to everyone and photography was her life. Uh, so much so that after she graduated with honors majoring in photography from the University of Wisconsin in 2002, uh, she had immediately taken a job as a portrait photographer in Green Bay. Uh, not long after this, she actually realized that she wanted to own her own business, though. A little, um, a little businesswoman. So she started uh, photography by Teresa. And she loved taking photos of people. And she did weddings and graduations. And... Because she's the opposite of you, Denny. Uh, she loved children. <laughs> and she had a way with them. <laughs> you mean children don't love me? <laughs> They're the worst. So fuck them anyway. Denny hates children, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> no, you hate the children. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she loved children and she just had a way with them. And um, and yeah, so she just, she loved photographing just people and people in their happiest moments. And she seemed like the kind of person that would be all over that too. She'd just soak it in. Um, but to supplement her new freelance gig, she took a part-time job with Auto Trader, uh, where she would photograph mm-hmm. vehicles for the magazine. Because it's hard out there, you know, being a small business owner. It's not always bringing in the dough, especially in rural Wisconsin. Um, so yeah, so she took a little part-time job with Auto Trader doing the photos uh, she eventually moved back home and lived in a farmhouse on her parents' land uh, while she lived her little dream because yay. that's totally the way to go. Uh, yay for rural family homes, right? You and I, both of our are in our rural family homes. <laughs> We're in our rural family homes. Our rural family homes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so according to her friend, her photography business was going so well that she decided to put in her two weeks notice at Auto Trader. Uh, but not before they begged her for a favor. And that was to go on one more assignment that she didn't even want to go on. And unfortunately, this favor for Auto Trader ended up being the harbinger of her death. Enter the Avery residence. Let's get into this fucking shit. Ready to get into this darkness? All right. Mm hmm. That's our girl, Teresa. Rest in peace. Yeah, like I said, she sounds like she would be, I would totally hang out with her. All right, you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's okay. do it. Okay, perfect. So, Teresa Halbach disappeared on Halloween out of all, all days, October 31st, mm-hmm. 2005. So, her last alleged appointment was having a meeting at the Stephen residence at Avery's Auto Salvage to photograph his sister's minivan that he was offering for sale at autotrader.com. So Avery's Auto Salvage was a family-owned auto parts and salvage yard where Steve Avery helped his father, Alan Avery, along with his brothers. Now, it was about four days later on November 3rd when Teresa's mother, Karen Halbach, reports Teresa missing. So Sergeant Andrew Coburn started to trace Teresa's last steps and learned through an employment that on Halloween she was taking pictures of the Avery pop- property. Now, this was a pretty common occurrence for them having a, you know, salvage yard. So he just wanted to go check, ask some questions, and see if he can find any evidence about where she might be. So he questioned Stephen about Teresa's visit, and Stephen said, you know, she completed her business like normal. They did the transaction, and it only took a few minutes before she left. So. At this time, Stephen was already kind of a celebrity because he was held in prison for the rape and attempted murder for 18 years, which we talked about earlier. Now, Avery was currently in that lawsuit with Manitowoc County due to the false incarceration and was in line to receive millions of dollars. So because Andrew Colborn knew this, he kind of tried to, you know, be really friendly with Avery and kind of try to just push it along to get to the next person. You know, he didn't want to start mm-hmm. anything, but he did note that Stephen Avery was acting really nice. And maybe he was just happy because... About to get millions. About to get millions. I'd be happy too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the next day, Stephen gives Lieutenant Jack Link and Detective Dame Rimaker of the Sheriff's Department permission to search his trailer. Now, they did do a quick search and reported they found nothing. 
immediately. The next day, Stephen and the Avery family are still being cooperative. They're still being cool. Um, they give the police complete access to the salvage yard so they can at least look for, you know, Teresa, but they're really looking for her car, which was a Toyota RAV4. Now, the Avery property was a 40-acre property with more than 3,000 vehicles. So this was a, you know, huge task. So they had volunteers, family, friends, everyone come around just trying to find any piece of her. Within 30 minutes, Teresa's Hallback's cousin found her car hidden on a ridge of the property under a bush pile. Um, it looked like it had been stripped of some items, almost like it was being prepared to be recycled. Shady. Right? Sure. So... The authorities immediately hold a press conference about the case, citing a conflict of interest due to Stevens' penny lawsuit. So they immediately turned over the case to Calumet County Sheriff's Department and Wisconsin Division of Criminal Investigation. So I know that on Making a Murderer, they made it sound like Manitowoc County was completely, you know, in charge of all this. But that wasn't the case. They immediately handed it over because they were in a rural area there were police in Manitowoc County that were helping with the case but they were constantly supervised by the neighboring county so Stephen was not arrested they didn't have enough evidence they want to kind of keep it clean so according to multiple officers work in the case they said because of the conflict of interest and his prior false conviction they wanted to make sure they had everything possible to make sure if he was the suspect or not or if it was someone else because he was so high, high profile they didn't want to have that on their books mm -hmm. so yep by November 7th, Manitowoc County District Attorney Mark Rohr announces a press conference and completely handed the case over to Ken Kratz, who is the District Attorney of Calumet County. So, 11 days after Teresa disappeared, so this is around November 9th, Stephen was arrested. But he wasn't arrested for her murder. He was actually arrested because during one of the searches, he had some illegal firearms, it sounded like. They were seized during those searches. Even so... Stephen was interrogated by mm -hmm. Mark Reigert and Tom Fassbender. Now, he maintained his innocence, said the evidence, if there was any, was being planted by Manitowoc County's officers to derail his $36 million lawsuit because it was said that the insurance wouldn't cover it. So this is when mm -hmm. shit starts hitting the fan. So authorities start looking in Teresa's mm -hmm. car, and they found six different places in Teresa's car that had Stephen Avery's blood in it. They also found Stephen's sweat DNA under the latch of the car. Mm -hmm. Besides the vehicle, the fire pit near Stephen Avery's home, officers found bone fragments and teeth as well as burned clothing, a partially burned shovel, a cell phone, and a camera. Along with that, they found still belts of about six tires that are used for fire accelerants, which were intertwined with bone fragments. They also found multiple buckets that appeared to be used to carry around burned remains. They also found leg irons and handcuffs in the Avery residence. Well, he said, you know, hey, me and my girl are kinky, mm -hmm. but they were there. I was just going to ask, what are leg irons? I read that and I did not know they're what They're like, uh, um, they're chains that have like these little round metal pieces that go around your ankles to kind of hold you down. You know mm -hmm. how you can have like you know, like, how am I supposed to describe it? Handcuffs for your wrist? They're like handcuffs for your ankles. Okay. So you can okay. hold someone on. I have it. Yeah, it's a little BDSM-y. I don't have it, but I'm, I have it in my I head. wish I had it. <laughs> Not that it's my I'm going to have to go on Amazon. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> I have it in my brain. I have the yeah. image in my brain. <laughs> when all this was found, this is when Stephen Avery was finally, you know, arrested for the murder of Teresa Hallbach. Now, from there, Stephen Avery's luck that he had been receiving for the last few years, you know, the support from his community, completely started to deteriorate. His lawsuit completely fell through, and his multi-million dollar lawsuit was pretty non-existent. The Innocent Project, even, who helped free Stephen, took him completely off the website. A justice reform bill, which was going to be named after Stephen Avery, is renamed the Criminal Justice Reform Package. Even the Wisconsin State Senate President, Adam Lassie, introduces a referendum to try to actually even reinstate the death penalty in Wisconsin. Now, Wisconsin hasn't had the death penalty since 1853. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been yeah. a minute. It's been a minute. So, early December, a little over a month after Therese was reported missing, Avery's preliminary trial takes place. It is revealed that Sergeant Andrew Coburn and Lieutenant James Link both were supposed to be defendants in Stevens' lawsuit, which causes red flags and does help create the narrative in making a murderer that, you know, it might be an inside job because mm -hmm. they were the one investigating it. 
They definitely fed that successfully. Oh, absolutely. And why wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, it was made for great TV, so. So three months after his arrest, Stephen settles his lawsuit for only $400,000, reportedly netting 2400 I'm at 2020. <laughs> 240000 Sorry about that. And he was... Uh, went down <laughs> a lot of taxes um intending to use the money to hire defense lawyers dean strang and jerry Putin. so you guys probably recognize them if you watch the documentary they're they're very much involved in that oh yeah i remember there being a whole fashion movement over dean strang's outfits do you remember oh, this? yeah <laughs> the guy's I, playing up like wait, wait they were like sweaters or something i don't remember what but it was hilarious and i remember following uh, his fashion choices <laughs> do you just have like a whole closet full of sweater vests now yeah the Madine Strang <laughs> sweater vest Madine Strang okay. <laughs> <laughs> so during all this um, Teresa Holbuck's family does file a wrongful death suit against Stephen to ha- try to prevent him from using the money from his settlement to hire lawyers um, because the settlement money never actually touched Stephen's hands it was out of reach for the wrongful death suit so During February of 2006, Stephen Avery's lawyer, Dean and Jerry, worked on building the case that he was framed, and the prosecutor, Ken Kratz, worked on helping Teresa's family receive justice. Both parties start interviewing family and learn that Stephen's nephew, Brendan Dassey, may have been a possible alibi for Stephen Avery on that October 31st. So, Brendan first came under radar when his family and friends started to see that something was off with Brendan. He lost 50 pounds. He was even more reserved than normal. Brendan was known to have a learning deficiency, but this was beyond his normal behavior. So, Brendan was interrogated multiple times, but the biggest bombshell in this case was actually on March 1st, 2006, when Brendan actually confessed to being involved in the murder of Teresa Halbach with his uncle, Stephen Avery. Now, I don't know if you actually watched this um, press conference, but this is a really fucked up one, and I, I think everyone should watch this if you haven't. Mm-hmm. They showed a little bit of a, on making a murderer, but it's pretty gross. So immediately the next day, Prosecutor Ken Kratz holds a super controversial televised press conference outlining dark details of Avery's nephew, Brendan, confessing to the murder. It, it is pretty dark. It gets into groomy details. He talks about his uncle sweaty. <laughs> Like, it's mm. it's a little inappropriate. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, completely. Be warned. Yes. Um, and he also tells the public he will be charging him with intentional homicide, mutilation of a corpse, sexual assault, kidnapping, and false imprisonment. Um, and this is all along when no one really has details of the case. They know the car was found, but they don't know much about it. And they don't know much about Brendan mm-hmm. Dassey yet. So this is when the public, along with multiple family members, including Stephen's own brother Chuck, no longer believes in Stephen's innocence. Like, there's mm-hmm. multiple telephone calls you can listen to that are not in Making a Murderer, that it's a lot of fighting between the family. Yeah, because it's crumbling for sure. Yes, it's pretty gross. So during Brendan's initial court appearances, his court-appointed lawyer tells Judge Fox that Brendan only committed the crimes because his uncle Stephen told him to. Now, Brennan is offered a deal if he agrees to testify against his uncle, Stephen, but that is when Brennan kind of starts claiming he is innocent and he doesn't know anything about this. Now, during all this, it wasn't a big case internationally like it is now. This was more local, but it did spark local outrage for the next few months. Um, The local community starts hearing word that Brendan is now claiming innocence and the Avery family is claiming Brendan and Stephen were innocent. So all of a sudden, this family, like half the family switching, half the family's going, you know, he did it. No, he did it. Um, there was also a huge backlash against Weiger and Fassbender because Brendan was accusing them of coercion in his confession. So it is learned that Brendan, only being 16 years old at the time, did not have his mother present during the interrogation, and because of his learning deficiency, he may not have known all of his consequences or even what he was confessing to. So even with all these things being true like having a faulty interrogation not having his mother present and you know obvious learning deficiency things didn't start going well for brendan because the claims he made originally that his uncle did it had evidence that the police was finding to possibly be true brendan had told weigar and fassbender that Teresa was shot in the garage where bullets that matched even avery's gun in his bedroom were actually found 
One particularly, mm-hmm. according to the DNA expert in the case, actually contained a trace of Teresa's DNA, which again, I mean, <laughs> that should be enough. <laughs> is it shown on making a murderer much? Not really. Not really. Nope. Very briefly. Yes. So Brennan said his uncle and himself tried to wash the garage floor with oil and bleach. Um, there seemed to be some red matter on the floor and an attempt at cleanup. But the crazy thing that I thought was very interesting was the pants that Brennan was reportedly wearing that night was completely fl- filled with bleach spots. So if you weren't cleaning up with bleach, why are your pants polka dotted? Sorry. Sorry. Um, Brennan claimed him and his uncle poured gasoline and burned pieces of Teresa's body in the burn barrel on the property, which is not only where Teresa's bone fragments were found, but it was also almost identical to a case that Avery was involved in in 1982. Now, this case is, again, kind of glossed over in the documentary, but he actually put a live cat on the fire and poured gasoline on it. This was after the cat, at first, he threw the cat in there and it tried to escape. So, poor baby. Yeah. So in 2007, after the trials, both Stephen Avery and Brennan Dassey were convicted of the murder of Teresa Halbach due to all the evidence. Now, through all of this, documentarians Laura Riccardi, and I keep saying, I feel like I'm saying her name wrong, so I'm sorry, Laura, if that's the case, and Myra Demo spent a decade working closely with the Avery and Dassey lawyers and the Avery family documenting these arrests, trials, and the constant denial of retrials. So, Make It a Murder sparked outrage throughout the world because they showed the interrogation of this young man who seemed to be coerced. On the documentary, it depicted the police officers feeding him all the information and Brennan signing his life away, and they're showing this without showing the evidence mm-hmm. that connected it. Yep. So, Brendan does admit to police officers during his interrogation that he did rape Teresa Habach, but he did it because his um, uncle, Stephen A., re-instructed him. He then stated his uncle had stabbed Teresa in the bed. They brought her to the garage, shot her, and mutilated her body before setting it on fire in the outdoor burn barrel. Now, of course, watching police officers seemingly give this information to this young boy sparked outrage and so it sparked even more outrage that this documentary creates a narrative that seems coerced to this vulnerable child so a lot of people who watched the documentary including our interviewee today christine mm-hmm. got involved in the case to help with justice reform due the due to this confession now the sad part is that when people actually started re-watching making a murderer and researching making a murderer's narrative the horrors that brennan described him and his uncle placing Teresa under the halloween night you know seemed to be true and not only seemed to be true had the evidence behind it yeah so this is when and we'll talk about convicting a murderer a tiny bit here yeah Six years ago, a documentarian named Sean Reich, along with Brenna Schuler, actually joined forces because they wanted to tell Teresa's story. Um, they kind of wanted to get it out to the public. There were some, like, which I found, like, YouTube, like, what did making a murderer leave out? And I know that Ken Kratz wrote a book um, to try to show that, but because Ken Kratz was so hated, you know, it was, people weren't really taking his word for it, especially because there were some things that came out mm-hmm. about Ken Kratz where it's like, you know, He's kind of a douchebag. Yeah, questionable. Questionable <laughs> you know? human. But. He's a... Exactly. Does it make him a liar in a case he's a lawyer for? I don't know. But it was evidence. Mm-hmm. It was facts. Mm-hmm. There was blood found. So we're going to tell a little bit about the facts um, that aren't convicting a murderer, but also ones that I made sure were true, too. So I'll go back and forth. I will say if I found that they were 100% true or they were from a you know documentary, which I'm trying to do as best as I can, people. Yeah. So facts... I'm trying my best. Because surprisingly, even when I was looking at, um, oh, I want to see if this is true or trying to kind of double check something, a lot of it would reference making a murderer Mm -hmm. and not the actual case files. Yeah. And you're like, have we learned nothing? (laughs) Yeah. I was like, I'm not saying anything. It's almost like when I did John Panay, when I did John Panay, I was finding case files. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was finding case files as the facts. Obviously, there were stories out there and people having opinions. But with this case... Making a murder is almost used like a fact sheet. Yeah. When in th- it's really more of a, a theory sheet. <laughs> yeah. So please take that with a grain of salt. If Even if you're researching what I'm saying, because don't take what I'm saying as truth. I want you to go look for the truth. Check if it's from the documentary mm-hmm. compared to the case for sure. 
Now, I'm going to tell you some facts. Now, facts are in Halloween of 2005, Teresa was called to the Avery house to take a picture of that van. Now, Teresa has done this, like I said, multiple times before, but she was hesitant this time. She had been telling multiple people that one of her auto trader clients she photographed for, named Stephen Avery, was showing extremely inappropriate behavior towards her. He had answered the door in a towel before, and he went as far as pointing at a picture on his wall filled with women, claiming he had sex with them, and telling her she was going to be on that wall one day. Mm-hmm. I remember reading that. Like, what? Yeah. Okay. And I, this is fact. She was telling people this mm-hmm. before this incident. Yep, straight out Again, of her mouth. straight out of her mouth. Now, this day, Teresa was told she was going to go to the Avery lot, but that it was not Stephen Avery she was going to see, but his sister to photograph her van. Facts are, though, Stephen Avery was the one that actually called Auto Trailer and asked for Teresa specifically to come out, and he used his sister's name to do it. He even called to sell a van his sister admits over and over again that she didn't even want to sell. Yeah, wasn't she saving it for her kids? And she just bought a brand new yeah. seat. <laughs> she yeah, she just bought a brand new seat that he was going to burn. Yeah. In the burn barrel. Why? Yeah. Makes Why? no sense. Right? Mm-hmm. Makes no sense. No. So why might you ask? So Stephen had called Teresa multiple times on Star 69 to hide his identity. And of course, she's not going to answer. He was trying to hide his identity. Why would he do that if he didn't have a hidden agenda let's say yeah it's definitely creepy as fuck creepy as fuck i was just gonna call you out on star 69 because you know i love calling you out all the time yeah my little 90s baby memory is remembering star 69 was to call the last person star 67 was to block your number really yes maybe it is i did a lot of prank calling in my day (laughs) Well, star 67. Yes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. You may proceed. So, I may proceed. So another lie that Stephen did tell police was that he didn't burn anything that night. He wouldn't know why there would be anything in the, you know, burn pit. It was not until Stephen's younger brother, Earl Avery, was recorded on a phone call. I'm going to do this super, Wisconsin, can I do Wisconsin voice? See if I do his voice well. Yeah, it's basically Minnesotan. <laughs> that burn barrel was burning too there and i drove right by that son of a bitch <laughs> what <This one. laughs> that was more <laughs> <That's> terrible <laughs> that <was our> country <laughs> that was definitely more like southern i drove right by that son of a bitch <laughs> that son of a bitch <laughs> i kind of love that <laughs> start, <laughs> start saying that you gotta more. pronounce your o's a lot more it's definitely stand like, right by that son of a son of a bitch son of a i say bitch. o's big <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, that actually reminds me of uh, the movie Wanderlust. Yes. <laughs> You're going yep. to take that. Dick. Good dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul Elizabeth. Yes. Take that out, dick. Take that out, dick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everybody pause. Go watch uh, Wanderlust yeah. and come back. All right. Exactly. Go do that. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, perfect. So, jailhouse call. His brother is like, no, I seen you burning stuff. Pretty <laughs> fucked up. And what I'm learning about Steven is it's like, does he realize that all of his phone calls are being recorded? Like, there's so much stuff that, like, keeps coming out with him and his family that shows, that tells facts. And he just yeah. keeps talking. He just keeps talking. He's bored as fuck in jail. And yeah. he's dumb. Let's be honest. Yeah. He's probably just facts. completely forgotten. He's just like, they're, okay. I'm going to do something again. They not looking at my phone calls. Uh, they ain't not looking at my phone calls. No. No, they're not looking at your phone calls, Stephen. Not looking at your phone calls. <laughs> so, you know, he had to admit, he told police that he actually did have a fire. He invited his, you know, nephew Brennan over, which the family even said that wasn't something he did. He never did that before. It's not like he's like, nephew, come over. Yeah, they. I think they were like, he never burned fires, like ever. Not even. No leisurely just they know he never used it (laughs) yeah so that's why it was so obvious to the family it was a big like okay we saw you doing that buddy Mm -hmm. all right so making a murder obviously left that out and that's why you really didn't see earl avery too much on there because it really didn't give the 
you know, impression that they were trying to give in that documentary because Earl didn't really say too much good things about him. So the biggest things making a murderer left out was almost all the evidence I told you, like the DNA found in the car, the bullet matching Stephen's gun, obviously the tools, the fire pit, and of course the clues regarding Teresa's car. Um, as I stated before, Teresa's car was found at the Avery residence, um, which a lot of people do talk about in making a murderer one and two, and they do an excellent job in that documentary to show how that car could be planted there, which is what it shows. But not only that, because Stephen works the salvage yard time and time again, Stephen does make the claim like, well, if I did it, why wouldn't I have just crushed the car? And that's mm-hmm. what a lot of his supporters say. He's right there. There's a car crusher. Why wouldn't he just crush the car? So... I don't know. That's a good question. That's a compelling point. Although maybe that was, maybe he thought that that was going to bring more attention. Like, like his family didn't know he wasn't, there was, they were not planning on crushing cars today and I heard him crush a car. We're going to throw some facts out here about this car. So, Teresa's (laughs) car was in an area on the edge which was right next to the car crusher and a row that the Averys typically put the cars they would put in line to recycle and crush. It was also in prep mode, which I was telling you about. So you can't just crush a car. You can't just put a car in a car crusher. You have to remove all different parts. You have to remove batteries. You have to recycle certain things. And you even have to remove the liquids because what ends up happening if you don't remove like gas and all that, when the car crusher starts, it can start a fire. It's not a fast process. Yeah. It was only three four days it just can't happen um the avery's also can't crush multiple actually crush multiple cars at a time instead of doing one at a time so they weren't ready for their next batch yet so it's like if he was running this huge car crusher that makes all this noise and the cars aren't ready to be crushed yet the family be like why the fuck is he out there running that huge machine right now like everyone would know yeah he he had to wait and it was in the area being prepared so take that mm-hmm. as you will. Coincidence? Was it planned or was it planted, right? You decide. You decide. <laughs> but let's be real, right? Yeah. So <laughs> so making a murder also left out the extreme abuse that Stephen Avery has shown towards women, documented starting from his marriage in the early 1980s. So this is one thing I want to put out. You know, in the documentary, I don't know how you felt, but when I saw like Stephen Avery in that documentary, I thought he was like the cutest little teddy bear sweet big man the way he was like hugging everyone he was so happy the family was so happy definitely that first first episode first two episodes or whatever yeah you're just like yeah oh look at him you're like he couldn't do anything and the family was so happy and he just always came off even when you hear him talk he has like a certain Mm -hmm. voice that just is kind of a little soothing what you hear at least what the documentary is feeding lets you hear Yes, exactly. And so I really thought, like, you know, he doesn't have a history. Why would this be? But the fact is, he does. He actually wrote his wife in the 80s threatening letters stating he was going to kill her. Mm -hmm. He even sent his own children letters saying that he was going to kill their mom. And that is why his children do not communicate to him this day. Um, His two twin boys that he had when he was younger only did one interview after this documentary and even they said like my father's a violent man and they even said in this interview which you can find on youtube i highly suggest doing Mm -hmm. it that they even stopped visiting him because they would beg his mom i don't want to visit him in prison because he would actually hit them in prison jesus christ what an idiot yeah exactly so yes there was a huge history of violence now, Stephen's first fiance in the Making a Murder documentary, you probably saw her. Um, she came forward after being threatened and abused herself. The, again, also jailhouse phone calls was his family was talking to him about how he would actually beat her at even family functions in front of people, Fucked pulling up. her hair yeah. in front of people. Here's our hero. Now, <laughs> I'm going to say really... Yeah. So the sad, really sad part about this is they end up breaking up during the documentary and they do show a little bit of her talking about it, but they don't go into it a lot. She did a few interviews and you can see how terrified she is in her face because she was having fans when she came forward and talked about her abuse, harassing her, threatening to kill her, threatening to like rape her, saying that she was lying. She was just in it for the money, everything like that. This was an abuse victim. fucked up. It's super fucked up. 
Um, his second fiance also left him because she was started to get terrified because he would give threatening phone calls to her and he started ten- sending her terrible messages from prison. It almost mm-hmm. like silenced her. So some of the worst evidence, and this is gonna be where the biggest trigger warning is, some of the worst evidence that I found out about Stephen Avery is he actually admitted to raping his young niece when she was underage and he actually has the audacity to call it an affair that he was having an affair with her, like they had an actual relationship. Jesus Christ. This is documented not only through phone calls with the family, not only through his ex-fiance, but this is documented through pictures that the family has. And that you can see. I don't want to see him, because obviously I don't want to see a, a young girl be abused, but... I I mean, and then I also want to put what I'm about to say next. It's allegedly because I don't have if it's true, but I always want to believe Mm -hmm. victims, of course. But I'm going to say Mm -hmm. allegedly because I don't want to get sued. Mm -hmm. Um, There are other family members, male and female, underage and not underage, that have accused Stephen Avery of also sexually abusing them and physically abusing them. Not great. Yeah. So that's the lovable, sweet guy my little teddy that, bear that you see in that and i wonder mm-hmm. if i didn't hear this phone call until convicting a murderer and it made me really sad so the two women who were involved with making a murderer um there's a phone call you hear in convicting a murderer it was kind of right when they got involved and it was even before um brendan came forward they were on a phone call with Stephen avery and they're like no we believe mm-hmm. you it doesn't matter what he says and that's before even having any of the evidence or even starting this. So that's kind of kind of terrifying to think that. Yeah. Like, so you obviously found out all this and you still did it. Not really a woman's woman, just saying. Not really a woman's woman. Mm-hmm. No. 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 So multiple fans of Avery have come forward also um, who have become pen pals with him. Obviously through this, he's got a lot of fans, a lot of young ladies, pen pals, everything like that. And Stephen Avery has started sending them discussing images, dark sexual images um again i'm not here to convince you look into yourself don't believe me find out yourself um but Mm -hmm. fortunately and unfortunately today we will have some of those pictures and evidence of stephen avery um has had an abuse with women and we will post those on our our instagram and facebook just so you know we're not lying Mm -hmm. so yep now the question is does stephen avery being a fucking scumbag to women mean he's a murderer no but there's a history yeah um but like i was saying here it is really depressing to see a documentary made by two women who are obviously very smart and know how to make an excellent film and know how to make a documentary that literally has you know kind of changed the course of how documentaries are made today again not be a woman's woman Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah you know it's unfortunate silencing abuse victims it is really sad mm-hmm. um steven's own ex-fiance even said that steven told her kind of when they were dating right at the end that bitches owed him because he was locked up for 18 years and he didn't get any pussy pretty much <laughs> okay and brendan also said that he said something very similar during the attack like bitches owe yeah. him because okay. he didn't get pussy and he likes to use that word a lot, which I hate the word pussy. Unless I'm calling my husband a pussy, that's the only time I like the word. I do too. I do too. I do not, yeah, I don't like it uh, when it's referring to a vagina. A vagina or a vulva. But yeah, when you're but calling somebody pussy. a little bitch or a little pussy, yeah. it's different. But I yeah. agree. Just like, ugh. It's like the most unsexy thing ever in the world, so. It is. I agree. So coming back to the main event, which I believe is why Making a Murderer did touch so many people's heartstrings, are bruh, Brendan Dassey. So his course interrogation, as shown on the documentary, was told to the viewers that the only real, that, that was the only real piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. You know, the reason that they are in jail was because of this one coerced conversation. Mm-hmm. So besides this, the documentary shows the interrogation as if Brennan Dassey was pulled out of class and then fed the information. But sadly, the facts are that this was Brennan Dassey's fourth interview. And the police were just gathering information that were already told to them. And you can see all this, but they didn't show that in Making a Murderer. Again, was it right they still did that without the parent present or without a lawyer present? Absolutely not. But... Even on that interview, because he's kind of already given a lot of this information, his mother went outside to go smoke a cigarette, and they asked Brendan, hey, your mom's leaving. Do you still want to chat or should we wait? And he's just like, no, it's cool, pretty much. Yeah. So she was there, but, I mean, that happened. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. Wasn't as present as needed. Absolutely wasn't. So I'll pause again. Again, say please do not take my word for it. Go look at those. You can watch all the Brennan Dassey's things. Be weird. Dig yourself into a hole. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the theory of people who believe Stephen Avery is innocent, whether that's from the documentary or information they gather themselves, was that everything was planted from the car to the bones all the way down to Stephen Avery's DNA. Most believe it was planted by Manitowoc County because the lawsuit, even though it has been shown time and time again, this in no way affected their pay. This in no way affected their retirements. This didn't affect their jobs. This didn't affect the county at all. It was insured either way. Even though it was acting like it, you know, it was fine. They weren't going to insure $35 million because they didn't, that was just what it is. But it wasn't yeah. mean he wasn't going to get paid. So it is yeah. kind of a weird thing to push on that because it doesn't change their lives. So they're not going to get anything out of that. So that's yeah. okay if that's what you believe, but that's just a fact. And again, don't take my word for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, should be irrelevant. Yes. But now I would like to take you on the journey of Christine, who we've talked a little bit about here. Someone who went deep into this case and became friends with Kathleen Zellner, Stephen Avery's current attorney, known as the rock star that we all know of overturning convictions. She is a rock star, like her or not. Um, Kathleen mm-hmm. Zellner took this high-profile case immediately after seeing Making a Murderer and was the main focus of Making a Murderer 2. For 10 episodes, she shows experiments as well as pointing at, you know, the evidence toward Bobby Dassey, which is Stephen Avery's older nephew, as a possible suspect. But what we are going to learn through our interviews with Christine again is that not everything looks like it seems. And she went from a huge supporter, someone working close to this case, someone working PR, to someone with a completely different mindset. So here's the Mm -hmm. interview I did with Christine Franson. All right, Christine, introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine. Um, I live here in Fergus Falls with Denny. I have a tendency to go big or go home. And so when I see a problem, I go um, a little crazy trying to fix it. And so I started a home grooming business as, that is now a boarding facility in, in grooming business. Um, and I started a small um, LGBTQ youth group that turned into Fergus Pride. And it sounds like you kind of did the same. Today we're talking about the Avery family. What made you, uh, you know, decide to contact them or get involved in that case? At so first? more, more go big or go home yeah. mentality. Um, I watched Making a Murderer over the holiday season of 2015. It was released on December 18th. Um, I didn't get around to watching it until December 30th um, because everybody was in my inbox saying, "Oh my God, you have to watch this! You have to watch this!" Mm-hmm. It was actually I was at my sister's when we watched Making a Murderer up in Lutzen. And it was in the middle of a blizzard when we drove back. So I had plenty of hours in the car to dig up all kinds of information. Um, It was very strategic and brilliant on their part to release it um, over a holiday vacation because it was arguably the biggest true crime docuseries that had hit streaming services um, at that point. And it launched a series of true crime docuseries and documentaries after that. So... Um, kind of the catalyst for a lot of those types of documentaries. Um, I watched it. Um, I didn't really know what to think of Stephen Avery. I kind of had a, a, a bad vibe, a few red flags there. It was clear that they were glossing over some things, mm-hmm. you know, an issue regarding him burning a cat, an issue regarding previous burglaries. I mean, it was very clear that they were trying to spin a narrative that this guy was just a big, lovable teddy bear who just made a few mistakes and hung with the wrong crowd. Um, It wasn't until we got to episode four when they started discussing Brendan, his 16-year-old nephew, um, and his interrogation and some of the techniques that were used to interrogate him and then digging further into it. I'm one of those that grabs my phone in the middle of a documentary. I'm the same, yep. I'm like... Have to research everything. (laughs) Yep, I'm like, okay. So, I mean, I'm like, I'm way ahead of the game. I do this with movies too. I'll be like halfway through a movie and I'll go to Wikipedia and read the plot to see if I want to continue watching it or not. Um... And so I was already doing research, and I hadn't even finished the documentary yet. Um, And so we got to episode four, and I looked into it, and I found that he was interrogated four times, um, starting um, November 6th was the first one, and then he was interrogated again um, February 27th, and then again on March 1st, um, and then again a subsequent, subsequent one in May. Um, all of these done without an attorney or a parent present. 
And I couldn't understand how in our nation that that was possible, especially given the fact that this kid clearly was not just your typical 16 year old and had Mm -hmm. some intellectual um, and and, uh, social impairments. And so I guess I originally got involved to reform juvenile interrogation. Um, I didn't really pay too much mind regarding Stephen Avery. Obviously, you know, he was the the, uh, focus of this case, um, but my concern was mostly with Brendan. Um, And yeah, that's how I got involved. I had a 14 year old son at the time who was Asperger's. um, And I imagined the police picking him up from school and asking him a few questions and saying, hey, we're your friends. Uh, This isn't really about you. We just want to know what you're, you know, we want to ask you a few questions about something your friends did. Um, And Jet had limiting, uh, limited uh, coping skills. Mm -hmm. And he probably would have said anything to get out of that room. Oh, absolutely. You can see, especially during the Making the Murderer, how they, you know, did that interview. Right. Showed that interview in that movie. It really did, you know, touch a lot of people's heartstrings because you kind of think of that friend or child, especially yeah. a child that you know that may be on the spectrum or may have, um, you know, things that it would be better if they had a parent there t- because they're just trying to get out of it. You know, he thought he was going to go back to school after that interview. Right. So in looking into juvenile interrogation reform, and so I had joined various Facebook groups and I had started reading some of, you know, the, the past articles from like when, when the murder happened or when the cases were being um, presented in court. So I wanted to go back to the very beginning because that is where you're going to find the most um, credible ev- our information is really, really early on. So I wanted to dig back as far back as I possibly could and not really enter into the discussion that was happening currently regarding making a murder. Yeah. Um, I had become a member of the family support group on Facebook uh, that was started by Carla Stevens' niece and a friend of hers. Uh, it was only like 2,000 members at that point in time. Um, and I had stumbled across a blog written by Convoluted Brian in 2009. A person had come to him in 2007 saying she was the wife of somebody she believes is a viable suspect in Teresa's murder. Oh. So anyway, um, this fake profile on Facebook started commenting and liking and following my comments in the Facebook family group regarding this blog from Convoluted Brian. There was a woman who was married to a German and there was a whole slew of very coincidental information regarding what this guy was doing during the period of time that Teresa went missing and um, when her car was found. And so... um, I, I, the, the name was Von Free Dental. Kind of Germany sounding, yeah, right? right? In my mind. Yeah. I just went on a limb and I commented um, on one of the things that she liked and tagged her and said, hey, Von, send me a message. And seconds later, she said, I am who you think I am. She was the German's wife and she was willing to give me every single bit of information I'd ever wanted. She had accumulated all of this information over years of time. Uh, police reports. Um, uh, you know, evidence of arson and pictures and women's clothing that was found on her property, porn magazines, um, just a whole lot of compelling stuff. And yeah. to this day, myself and Michael Grisbach, who was a previous DA, wrote a book on Defensible mm-hmm. um, by Stephen Avery. Mm-hmm. To this day, he and I do not understand why Stephen Avery's attorney has not used that possible yeah, alternate that's- suspect in lieu of this Bobby trail that she's going on right now, which is completely ridiculous. Um, But it was very compelling. And so that was literally like January 2nd. So keep in mind, I watched the documentary December 30th. And by January 2nd, I've got this woman um, using a fake profile, dumping all of this information on me. And so on January 3rd, I found out that Kathleen Zellner had finally decided to take Stephen Avery's case. She had been sent letters by Stephen and his then fiance for years and ignored them all. It wasn't until Making a Murder came out and was famous that she was like, okay, yeah. I'll take the case. Well, the, um, she's already fangirling Kathleen Zellner because she has the highest exoneration rate um, uh, wrongful convictions in this country. She is a powerhouse. Just yeah, say what you want about her. She's an amazing attorney. She's, what is she is? She's done? stunning. And yeah. she reminds me of Deb from 
Dexter, mm-hmm. like an older Deb. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so immediately I was taken by her and I thought, this is great. You know, so I had 150 pages of information mm-hmm. from this woman that I forwarded on to Kathleen Zellner's office before she even had publicly come out and said, I'm taking the case, which was January 6th. Mm-hmm. And on January 12th, I got a phone call from her. Uh, I thought it was going to be uh, an associate or an assistant yeah. or something like that calling me. And no, it was her. And she said, I really need to talk to you about all of this information. I think you may have broken this case. Uh, I spent an hour and a half to two hours on the phone with her. I was so nervous. I grabbed a bottle of wine. Yeah. And I couldn't find a wine glass, so I used a beer mug. And it turns out a beer mug actually only fills twice when you're pouring a bottle of wine. And oh. so I finished a bottle of wine um, in that um, hour and a half, two hour phone call. And we talked about all things EDTA, age testing on blood. Um, and she told me, quote unquote, um, I'm not going to wait on this. This isn't going to be three years like the Ryan Ferguson case. We're going to go in like a SWAT team and take mm-hmm. him out, and the science is going to prove he didn't do it. And I was all fired up. (laughs) I was like, this is awesome. And then I started working with her regularly. Um, The Avery family had asked me to become an administrator of the Facebook family group, which was growing by thousands every day. Mm -hmm. Um, It had gotten up to 600,000. And it was literally my mission at that point in time to work with Kathleen, to continue getting her information, and to filter out what was in the Facebook family group regarding anything even suggesting they were guilty. Yep. Um, And so the blinders were put on. The Mm -hmm. blinders were, I mean, I was like on a mission. In order to get Brendan freed, I needed to get Stephen freed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I needed to prove that Stephen didn't do it because if Stephen didn't do it, then everything Brendan said was a lie. And so that's what I did. I was, for for years and months, as I I put the blinders on, I was asked by Kathleen to stay in the family group to continue giving her information. Mm -hmm. I was hosting rallies, going to hearings. Um, and before I knew it, I had people like Rosie O'Donnell and Alec Baldwin and the voice of Siri and, you know, just a random people following me on Twitter. And I was neck deep in trying to get these two out of prison, ignoring red flags left and right, yeah. like deflecting them. As soon as a red flag would pop up, I'd be like, oh, you know, I was essentially doing um, PR for the Avery family and the Dassey family because people would come to me about things that they were hearing. Uh, support letters they were getting from Stephen that were, you know, mm-hmm. kind of crazy town. And it was my job to get rid of those things and to hide those things. Oh, really? Um, okay. Essentially, because it would make Stephen look guilty. Mm-hmm. And the goal was to get Stephen out. Um, there were pictures being sent, things he was drawing supporters. Um, you know, there were pictures that turned up with he and his 17-year-old daughter in his underwear, and he's on top of her. Mm-hmm. And as soon as those leaked someplace, it was my job. I mm-hmm. went to Kathleen. I said, these pictures are coming. And so she would she, she could prepare for it. Um, Stephen is going to do an article with In Touch without your permission. You need to be aware of it. And I would let her know. And, um, yeah, I, was, I went down a rabbit hole way further than I ever thought that I would. Um, what made Kathleen, do you think, start going for his nephew Bobby as a possible suspect. I don't think they really talked about the German fellow, but nope. what do you think made her start going towards Bobby? I know that there was some stuff he was looking at on his computer, um, you know, maybe a little BDSM, um, sure. maybe the time frame, everything like that, but what do you think made her kind of target the nephew? Uh, she needed reasonable doubt. She mm-hmm. needed an alternative suspect, um, and it was going to be more real- realistic if it was somebody in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, regarding the German, I don't know why she dropped that. Other than I was working very closely with, her name is Ava. Um, I was working very closely for, for days on days. Um, I was working with Kathleen's investigator, Stephen Kirby. We were working on creating an affidavit. We were going back and forth about what would be in that affidavit and what wouldn't be in that affidavit. And it was like the four of us emailing pretty regularly. And then she got spooked. Um, and she said, she sent us a series of crazy messages saying, you're trying to get me killed. You can do this without me. I'm not involved in this anymore. And then she flipped. And then the next thing I know, she's on Reddit stating that um, uh, we think her ex-husband did it. And so we've been going after her for information. And she never wanted to be involved at all. And she thinks Stephen's guilty, Uh, which is not what happened (laughs) By, by a long shot. And so I don't know if there were legalities in there that that caused Kathleen to drop that theory altogether. Um, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I was asked by Kathleen at one point in time why I never finished going. I, w- I went to school. I majored in law. 
um, why I never became a lawyer. And my response is, I don't have time for all of the red tape and all of the rules and, and the time, the, the wheels of justice taking years and years to turn. I just want to argue with people and win, and I can do that without being a lawyer. Sure. <laughs> and so basically, and she's like, I get it, um, because I just couldn't understand all that. So there are some legalities maybe involved Ten where later. she just decided to drop that theory altogether. Regarding the porn, Stephen had access to Barb's trailer whenever he wanted. Um, there's no there's no book that shows for sure these kids were in school on this day. Mm -hmm. There were several men living in that household. Um, and so who knows whether or not... So it's probably part of the documentary just trying yeah. to kind of show something bigger than yeah. it is. You know, I I'm mean... Like, well, I'm not here to kink shame. I always say that on this podcast. Well, but it's very you, interesting. They really do use that. And that's Bobby all they've got. Do. Yeah. And, and, a, and, a, and a witness years later that swears he saw or Bobby, saw an car. older gentleman, an older bearded gentleman, moving Teresa's car. Mm -hmm. um, I stand by the fact that your most viable evidence happens super early on. Super early on. The stuff that happens years later, um, you got to take with a grain of salt. And so I went back into the case a second time. Um, looking at just the early stuff, um, but I'm kind of skipping a few areas, so I'll, I won't go into well, that quite okay. yet. Um, making a murderer too mm -hmm. wanted me to participate, and I said no. Um, and I said no because a I was working with Kathleen at the time, and and if you've watched season two of Making a Murder, it's basically the Kathleen Zellner show. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's you know she's in control of all of that. Mm -hmm. That's all her stuff, um, and I just didn't want to be associated with that. Um, and I was already on the fence mm -hmm. and it didn't feel comfortable for me to do I was still in it more for Brendan mm -hmm. and not a whole lot of Brendan stuff was featured in Making a Murder 2 they touched on it Laura Nyrider and Stephen Drizzen who's a friend of mine uh, well on Facebook we're not like mm -hmm. tight by any means but I mean he, we've, we've been um, in communication off and on since the very beginning um, and uh they touched lightly on it and most of it was about Steven and most of it was about the evidence and I was watching I'm glad I wasn't involved in making a murder too because watching it now is very embarrassing um, some of the things that were said were blatantly false again mm -hmm. um, and some of the scientific um, experiments that she did not all of them were shown in making a murder too some of them were shown um, or submitted to the appeals court but one of them and this is a very brilliant woman she's very yeah super she brilliant I have seen her and heard of her reenacting other situations to garner scientific evidence that were thought out of the box, were brilliant. The ones that she did for this were just like, it almost, it's almost as though she knows he's guilty and she's just doing what she has to do. So uh, if anybody's been paying attention to this case, um, uh, Earl and a friend pulled up to Steven's trailer in a golf cart at around 5.30ish, something like that. Um, and there is a burn barrel outside of Stevens that they saw burning, smelt plastic, black smoke, and uh, she reenacted it. She reenacted it in the middle of a field mm -hmm. with a small hibachi grill, charcoal, put a, a cheap cell phone on top of the grate that goes on top of the charcoal and melted the phone and her and her associates walked around saying, I don't smell plastic at all, it smells like marshmallows. And that was their reenactment of a burn of a PDA, a phone, a camera, uh, probably the bedding, mm -hmm. probably some other things from the crime scene in a burn belt in full flames. When she has access to the Avery property and probably those exact burn barrels. <laughs> I was uh, going to ask, were you, were you involved still with Kathleen and working kind of PR for the Avery family while she was doing these experiments? Yep. yep. What was your feeling on it? Were you starting to like, were you questioning her at all? Or were you still kind of in the phase where you're like, I'm just kind of in this and just trying to move forward? I was questioning her. I was questioning okay. some of the family. I was questioning his innocence. At that time frame, I convinced myself, okay, so Stephen Avery's a vile, per, vile mm -hmm. human being, but that doesn't mean he murdered. Yep. Um, and so um, I did not know, obviously. I wasn't privy to all the things that Kathleen were, was doing. I was just in communication with her, giving her information. And she was giving me a little information. Um, I did know about the brain fingerprinting mm -hmm. early on because I think that's, that is, that's one of the first things that she did. And I, I couldn't understand why that would be the first test that she mm -hmm. performed. 
unless it was to appease her own mind as to whether he was guilty or not. Um, if you know anything about brain finger, fingerprinting, um, you can't ask a person any information regarding any public information. It does not sort out lies. It sorts out what you know. So they couldn't really ask any questions about what actually happened with Teresa because it's known. Your brain already knows that information. And so what they asked uh, him about was their theories of what happened. Oh, their interesting. Yes, their theories of what happened to her, of which he knew nothing about because that's not what happened to her. And so um, you'd have to look. I'm not going to go super wild into the brain fingerprinting, but I, I did not hold that in much regard at all. I was told originally that it was a lie detector test. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until later that he passed with flying colors is what I was told. And you heard that, so that yep. really kind of told you, like, I need to keep moving on. Yep. Okay. Um, and it turns out that it was not a lie detector test. Mm -hmm. It was a brain fingerprinting test. Um, and if you do a little research on that, it's nowhere near a lie detector test. Um, and the information that he responded to was their theory of what could have happened to Teresa based on what she feels is scientific evidence, splatter on the car and a very a few other things. Um, and so, I mean, as soon as I read the actual results, I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> Oh, do you know kind of around the time when that was? She did in February. So she took the case January oh, 6th wow, publicly, so and she started that test February. Okay. When, and that's an expensive test. Yeah. So I'm, I'm my theory, and she can't sue me, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> so my theory is that she needed to ascertain herself whether he was telling the truth or not. Well, I know even in the documentary, she, she says that she told Avery, you know, I'm going to find out by yeah. these tests if you did it or not. And in, obviously, I like to say in the movie, because I, you know, it's a lot different than possibly in reality, we're starting to kind of learn a few things. Um, she is putting out there, like, she has done all these tests, and she is 100% certain yeah. that he is innocent. Do you think she believes that? Truthfully? Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's very interesting that she's still on it, but of course, it's a fame thing, so I completely understand. Um, when did the makers of Convicting a Murderer start getting involved in the case? So I was um, at a rally in 2018. And I believe this is on the actual documentary. Yep. Yep, on Daily Wire. I was at a rally. It was a rally I was hosting, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and ironically, somebody had put this, like, uh, stand for innocence garb over mm -hmm. my neck. It's like wearable support gear, you know, like advertising support mm -hmm. gear. Seconds before they started filming me. So I look ridiculous. But whatever. It is what it is. Um at least I wasn't holding like the Stephen Avery fat head that somebody <laughs> was trying to get me to carry around. Um, anyway, I uh, was approached by them. Already not a big fan of Stephen. I don't talk a lot about Stephen in that yeah. doc in that interview. Even if you watch the full uncut, it was like forty five minutes. Um, I, I try very hard to stay off that subject at the time and focus on just the facts, just the evidence, and. And, and just or reform for I, juveniles. Watching it, I believe you did. I think you did a good job at, because um, a lot of people, like when they would come up to them and kind of ask them something about evidence that probably didn't look too good for Steven, yeah. a lot of people were like, no, that's not true or something like that, but you were not like that in the documentary. Like, okay, let's talk. Questions, um, so. I was approached by them as a college filmmaking group from Ohio. Mm -hmm. That's what they told me they were. And they wanted to do some interviews with people on the response to making a murderer. The social media response, the hype, the, you know, the call to, you know, for injustice. Um, and I thought, hey, that's cool. That's a documentary in itself. I had already mm -hmm. seen a couple of years of this stuff unfold online and in person. People were crazy, crazy. Um, some of the people, some of the fanatics, um, and I'm, I'm going to try not to name names, but one of them showed up at the Avery House Christmas Eve right after the documentary was released with his bags. He was going to move into Stephen Avery's trailer because he was going to find the murderer um, because he tried to kill his wife once and he knows how murderers think and Stephen Avery ain't no murderer. There's another gentleman who chased Ken Kratz down for his DNA in the street and almost ran him off the road. Um, there is another gentleman who is a convicted pedophile. Um, who was following people around, sending messages. There was a, an unexplained bomb threat at Manitowoc shortly after the do document. I mean, people responded to this thing yeah, it in, was... in a way that I've never seen anybody respond to anything before. If you look up on Facebook, there are literally hundreds of Facebook groups on 
innocent or guilty or both or free Brendan or free. I mean, it's just, it's, um, it sparked something and it sparked an infighting um, online between supporters and guilters, supporters and supporters, mm-hmm. never guilters and guilters. Yeah. No, everybody <laughs> thought Stephen Avery was guilter. was just like, yeah. Um, but Twitter wars broke out. Um, people were being harassed. I mean, it was it. the response to making a murder was huge. And so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll participate mm-hmm. in this because there's a lot there. It wasn't until uh, 2019 that I discovered that that was for convicting a murderer. And at the time when we first started hearing buzz about convicting a murderer, it took me a while to do a little research um, and find out who was behind it officially. Um, and I sent him a message and I said, hey, if you're the guy behind convicting a murderer, I want you to pull my footage. I don't want anything to do with it. Because at the time when they started filming me, they had a person who thought he was guilty or mm-hmm. thinks he's guilty come in and start questioning me and we questioned back and forth. We actually developed a pretty good rapport with each other. Uh, I had some valid points, he had some valid points. Um, Obviously the gears were grinding already Mm -hmm. in my head and so I was listening to everything he said. Um, You can't form a solid opinion unless you're willing to take in every piece of information. Um, And so if I was gonna stand by something it needed to have some credibility which means listening to everybody. And so, and so I knew that that footage was going to be out there and that this was going to be a Stephen Avery is guilty documentary. Mm-hmm. And I was already flipping a little bit. Sure. And so I was in my mind frame, if, if I decide he's guilty at some point in time, I don't want to be on the wrong side of this when this documentary comes mm-hmm. out. <laughs> yeah, you want to make and, sure you know everything. Yeah, and so I don't want to be touted as the mm-hmm. crazy supporter and be sitting watching it someday knowing he's guilty or thinking he's guilty and, and having to, to do that. And so um, that sparked a friendship. Mm-hmm. He and I started talking about you know a lot of things. We talked about Jet. We talked about Brendan. We talked about the truth. We talked about the integrity of documentaries. You know, um, and uh, I said, okay, um, you can you can keep it, um, but we should probably do a follow up at some point mm-hmm. in time. And he asked, would you be interested in a follow up interview? Um, we didn't get around to it right away, but they happened to be in the Minneapolis area and asked if I and another supporter um, who had created um, a page, not a group, a page, um, that we started working together on called Unmaking a Murderer. Mm -hmm. Um, And we went up to the cities and we sat with them um, and we talked about all sorts of topics. We talked about the German, we talked about fingerprints, we talked about the blood in the rab, we talked about the scientific tests that Kathleen had done that didn't pan out at all. Um, she was convinced that the blood in the rav mm-hmm. test uh, would prove um, age. Mm-hmm. Um, she was 100% convinced that they were going to test that and determine it came from the vial or it came from you know, a different time period then, and that didn't pan out. Um, we talked about the bones in the fire pit um, and she asked me, Brenda did, um, well, if you're on the fence at all, what would be the one thing that would make you call, mm-hmm. take pause? Um, I said, there are, no, there are no pictures of her remains in these tires. I keep hearing about all of these, you know, burned tires mm-hmm. with pieces of her, her bone in it. Where are these pictures? Uh, Because I couldn't imagine that. Like you burn a tire and it's going to have a few wires maybe. And they're talking about fragments of calcined bones embedded in the wire. And I'm like, my brain couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And then she showed me. Yeah. She showed me DCI photos. And what you don't know is when tires burn, it's like a Brillo pad. It's not just separated individual Mm -hmm. wires. It looks like an SOS pad. It's all kinds of tiny little intertwined wires um, that uh, bone were embedded in, (laughs) to be quite honest. And they have not been released to the public yet, and they will come up in the next episode. Um, There is one in Kratz's book. Um, But as soon as she showed those, and I'm on film, and I I don't think they, they might, they might Mm -hmm. in eight. There's a moment where you could absolutely see my face change. Yeah. That was the moment. How did you feel? What was the feeling? In it that you oh shit that, yeah I mean ser- seriously oh mm-hmm. shit um so I went back afterwards <clears throat> I went back afterwards um, home I was quiet and I'm never quiet all the way home and 
I had a conversation with Kevin and I said, I think I'm going to have to have them pull all of that. Yeah. I, they have to pull all of it. I can't be in, I can't be involved in this documentary. Were you worried because you were still in PR mode or were you worried because of what the supporters might do? I was worried about all of it. I was worried about all of it. I was worried about being viewed as a traitor. Mm -hmm. I was worried about the fact that I now look like a liar. I was worried about the fact that I have all these people following me. Um, and I, I was worried, I, I was worried about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it caused a lot of distress. Um, and so when it boiled down to, when I called Sean up, originally I was like, you have to pull everything. I can't be involved in this documentary. Megan and I had done it together. Um, and so they didn't want to pull all of it because we were together. They needed some of that footage. And I said, I have a decision to make. Am I the kind of person who is wrong mm -hmm. and washes my hands of it? Or am I the kind of person that takes full accountability and sees this through to the end? Um, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, I mean, that was, that was where I'm fa I had gotten so deep into it and I was the face of so much of it. And I was, you know, and I was like, yeah, I was an oh shit moment. And it was mm -hmm. like, what have I done? What have I, how did I not see this? Um, and realistically, had I not been working with Kathleen, had I not been administrating for the family, had I not got involved with some of those family members, I probably would have come to this conclusion much, much, much sooner. I'm an intelligent person. Yeah. Um, I ignored the red flags. And that's pretty indicative of everything in my life. I can give all kinds of good advice and look at things analytically from a standpoint, but as soon as it gets within my bubble, I feel like I lose all reason. Mm -hmm. Like I ignore red flags, I don't trust my intuition, I, you know, um, and that applies to many things in my life. And I had just, this had gotten too close to me um, for me to see it. And so um, I called Sean up and I'll never forget this conversation. And I told him, I said, you need, either need to pull all of this or I'm gonna let you film me go into this case all over again and yeah. uncover their guilt. Mm -hmm. And he he literally gasped mm -hmm. because I mean he already had a documentary, but this <laughs> was yeah. like um, and they ended up you know afterwards more people came forward and so my part in the documentary got smaller and smaller mm -hmm. and smaller, which I'm very thankful for given everything I've gone through this year. Um, but at the time, it was going to be like 25% of the documentary was watching me as a supporter evolve into what I know now. Um, and so, um, so a lot of my footage is on the cutting room floor, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Some of it I'm sad about. Um, I had an eight-hour interview with Fossbender, one of the people who interrogated Brendan. Yeah. And that was the reason I got involved in the case in the mm -hmm. first place. So I had a lot of questions for him. Um, and all of that is on the cutting room floor. I spent three days in Cleveland being filmed for eight to ten hours each day, and a lot of that is on the cutting room floor, which is fine because they got people like Kayla to talk, and they got people like Candy to talk, and they got Earl to talk, and um, and so that is vital information. It's super important, and but I my hope was is by dropping a lot of that footage, the message is still there. If you're going to have an opinion regarding anything, you need to be able to look at everything and acknowledge that you might be wrong. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. Have you seen all of the, all have, of it yet? I have not. You have I not? was supposed okay. to go yeah. to either Nashville or Cleveland because Sean asked if I would sit down with a discussion panel with Candace on a few other people mm -hmm. from the documentary and we were going to preview the whole thing and then have a discussion panel that was going to be filmed and used as like an after show. Mm -hmm. And the logistics didn't work out. I'm guessing it had much to do with Candace's schedule, uh, which is great because in that time, I'm not a fan of Candace yeah. at all. Um, and in that frame of mind that I was in at that time, just learning that they had taken it over, um, I don't know that I would have been able to keep my mouth shut regarding other subjects that I'd like to talk to Candace about. Yeah, but, how do you feel about that? I mean, I know that me as someone who, I try to always look at both sides of things. I'm very politically try to always keep an open mind and listen to everybody. But just like most people, as soon as I heard Daily Wire, because I knew about this documentary coming out when we first met. We didn't, you didn't know at the time who was going to pick it up. When Daily Wire, I found out they were the ones that did it and that Candace Owen was involved, my mind automatically went to the negative, which is wrong, I know. Mm -hmm. But automatically thinks like, oh, this is going to be a very political, agenda-driven documentary. Were you worried that that was going to make people kind of push away from it just because of that, even if there were facts? I had mixed feelings regarding it. I, I think it's an extremely biased platform. Mm -hmm. I don't like Candace Owens. Um, 
I'm sorry. I'm distracted by the fact that my yeah, cat, but Kitty my cat is assaulting me. Dinny right now. <laughs> and I'm just used to cats assaulting yeah. me. So, um, <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, I mean, I had mixed feelings about it. A, it's not going to get the viewership that it deserves because mm-hmm. there are important information on here. And, and more than learning the truth about Stephen Avery and Brendan, I wanted to expose what making a murderer did. Yes. It, to uphold the integrity of future documentaries. When you watch something that's called a documentary, mm-hmm. you expect to hear facts. truth, yeah. facts, unedited information, so that you can decide for yourself. Um, otherwise, it's entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's based on a true story, and not an actual true story. Um, and like I said, Making a Murder arguably was the catalyst for a lot of these documentaries. And if they're getting away with the blatant edits that they got away with, um, what's to say that other documentaries aren't going to do the same and then are you really watching documentaries or are you just watching more drama driven entertainment it really makes you look at everything as a whole and what can you trust right and that's really hard for sure I you know when I I know meeting you and you kind of telling me about it my mind was very much like what do you mean make and then watching convicting a murder it just I think we're on by the time this comes out might be on episode nine Right now, seven have come out, and just seeing the blatant, just taking words out of people's mouths and everything like that was shocking. What, how? I remember yours and my first interaction regarding, regarding it. I think mm-hmm. it was when Dolores died. Dolores is Stephen Avery's mother, Yeah, I think, and I, you know, I become friends with a lot of the Avery family, um, and... Uh, um, I posted about it, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, rest in peace, Dolores, something, something, something. And then you commented and said, I feel so sorry for that family. They're innocent. I wish they were free or something like that. And then I commented, like, girl, we need to talk. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Because I was already involved in convicting a murder at that time. And it just, this this has been six years. So it took a very long time to come out. COVID caused Mm -hmm. a lot of delays. Um, It did take a long time for this to come out. Um, yeah, and it felt like a lifetime. And so it was my understanding for a long time there were negotiations with Amazon, possibly even Netflix, although they were involved in a, uh, a lawsuit that Andy Colburn had started against them and the makers of Making a Murder. I was going to ask about that because I'm like, how? Because you can see just blatant lies on here. Mm-hmm. Even if they were doing a documentary to try to say, like, Stephen didn't do this, Yeah, they should have at least put the facts in the show why that is and not cut people just actually just cut stuff it was more than manipulation it was blatant lies they literally cut out Mm -hmm. answers to questions um in the wrong place just seems illegal um the latest discussion that they had on Mm -hmm. on seven where they talked about um uh the bullet Mm -hmm. um and his description the officer's description of the bullet if their argument is that they were constrained for time <laughs> and they needed to cut certain things because they only had so much time, then why make his answer to the question even longer? <laughs> yeah. Which is what they did. Um, I don't buy anything. Their, their uh, assertion that they're um, filmmakers and not in- investigators and that they're, it's up to the you know, audience to decide and um, it's bullshit. Mm-hmm. That conversation that Laura and Ni- or Laura and Moira had with Stephen the night that Brendan confessed. I saw. Yeah, that was they shocking. had not even heard everything. That that's that's something that convicting a murderer didn't touch on. They did not even know everything that Brendan had said, and they mm-hmm. said, "We're standing by you. We got you. We're moving forward. We, you know." And they didn't even know. Uh, they they were on a mission right from the get go. Um, and nothing was going to sway it, and they needed to manipulate and fit um, to to fit their narrative, and they made millions. It would honestly been a great documentary either way if they even went in with that mindset, and then after seeing the facts and continuing to make this, to put the facts out there. It would have been just been as successful. Just as successful. Mm-hmm. It really would have been. And they didn't care about Stephen and Brendan. They still don't care about Stephen mm-hmm. and Brendan. Um, they made them sign a clause um, stating that they were going to give them $5,000. Regardless of how successful making a murderer was, that was all they were going to get. Wow, that's really... So the family really hasn't gotten anything? The family got nothing. Really? Stephen got 5000 and Brendan got 5000 It's amazing. What are your feelings about Brendan now through all this? I think Brendan's a victim. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep, there are people that don't. There are people that believe that he was curious and had mindset and, and you know... 
a willing participant and, and enjoyed what he was doing. I don't think that's the case. I think um, Brendan is easiest to manipulate out of that family, but Stephen has manipulated every single member of that family. Do you believe, I know obviously his brother and his brother's ex-wife is on the documentary, Mm -hmm. which I'm happy that they're speaking out. That's pretty amazing of them. Do you believe any of the other family members know or believe that he's guilty? They they all do. They all know. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. Are they vocal about it? Uh, No, not since making a murderer. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that makes complete sense. Now, um, you know that they, they they had plenty to say before. Every single one of them has been a victim of Stephen in some form. Mm-hmm. Um, Brenda uh, Barb, sorry, not Brenda Barb, uh, was assaulted by him and won't discuss it. Um, she and I had a private discussion about it that I won't go into detail. Um, I believe a few other family members. Um, yeah. Stephen has has is, is assaulted and manipulated and lied to and victimized every single member of his family. But this goes way back, mm-hmm. and they don't touch in on on, on convicting too much. Um, they might regarding one phone call that Alan had with Stephen about Teresa. Mm-hmm. Um, they might that might be coming. Actually, it might be coming in this next episode. Can you chat about it? I can certainly chat okay. about it. Alan said some pretty vulgar things about Teresa in a phone call or jail phone call conversation when they found her bones in the fire pit. Well, can you say what words? Or you don't have to if you don't want. Um, to. yeah. I mean, you, you're you're you you're okay with language, right? Yep. No. Um, no. Stephen was on the phone with his father, saying, "Yeah, I guess they found uh, a bone of hers." Mm-hmm. Um, and, he, and Alan can't hear, and he's like, "What?" And he's like, "A bone." Of, you know, Teresa's. They mm-hmm. found a bone, I believe, with DNA on it. Uh, and he said, what, from her cunt? Interesting. Yeah. And that comes from Alan. And so, um, from what, her cunt? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that's one example of some of the conversations that have taken place in the jail calls. Um, Alan well, screaming at Brendan at one point in time not to take a plea deal. He was offered 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, if you do that, then you're putting Stephen uh, to prison too. Um, their mindset was he did 18 years for something he didn't do. And so if he killed Teresa, fine. Well, because like he already did 18 Ste- years. What's that sound like that was according to like all the people who are involved or was Steven that that was kind of what his mindset was. Even when mm-hmm. Teresa was like, I haven't had sex for this long. Yep. I haven't had a woman in this long. Um, I've been locked up. I get to do what I want now. Mm-hmm. So if obviously I like to say if he did do it, but yeah, I like to say that out, um, even though I am on the side of what say with everything that he... That have you come to the dark side? I have come to the dark side. Because we have side. cookies. <laughs> I was never... Um, even when I watched the documentary, I never sat there and believed like in his innocence necessarily. Um, I do believe that he needed another trial. Yeah. I did see it um, from what I saw on that. I'm like, I don't know if he did it or not, but I do believe because of this documentary and the things that I'm seeing that maybe things were planted there was a lot of stuff with the cops I'm like oh and I don't tr- I'm just a person who's never really trusted cops yeah it's in my toy native in me we don't, we don't tr- right we don't trust we don't trust government much um but so when I saw that I'm like he just needs and these things that maybe that I thought the cops planted and everything like that I'm like that needs to be off the table and then all these facts need to be out um, so it kind of just, when I've been watching Convicting a Murder, it's just kind of making me realize, oh, my intuitions were a little right. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You know your gut. Mm-hmm. Everything like that. It actually does surprise me, even with Convicting a Murder, watching the people on there that are still in his side. We even presented the facts. Unlike you, because at least you presented the facts and you talked about it. Um, a lot of people on there are like, I don't care. Yeah. Or when someone's like, what about this? Evan? I don't care. I don't want to know. Yeah, I don't they're, they're still like that. They're, I'm yeah. in a group called um, uh, Innocent or Guilty. Um, and the things they come up with and the theories they come up with and the way that they will deflect or the way that they will convince themselves that everybody else is lying but the known liar is telling the truth mm-hmm. um, is kind of astounding. Um, I don't understand how anybody can look at all of this and at least not go, well, there's yeah. a possibility. All it is is questioning. It's like even with this, with talking with you and how I want to do this, um, Nicole and I are going to talk more about Teresa's story because it's about Teresa. Everyone mm-hmm. always talks about the Averys and everything like that. And like they're the ones that, you know, are the victims mm-hmm. and everything like that. But it's like are we, no one really talks about Teresa that much. So we really want to focus on that. I want to hear your voice, of course. 
Um, but I wanted people to question it. I'm not here to make someone like, this is what it is. This sure. is facts. I'm, I don't know facts. I wasn't there. But I... But the facts that are there, you got to listen to them with everything in life because what ends up happening is you just become complicit right. in bad behavior if you don't. There are too many people in this world or nation or whatever mm-hmm. that live in echo chambers regarding everything because that's yeah. their safe place. We've become desensitized to a lot of stuff. So we stay in our safe place and we only mm-hmm. allow information in that aligns with our belief because if we have to think out of the box, that's uncomfortable for us. And that's regarding religion. That's regarding Mm -hmm. your stance on race, regarding your stance on LGBTQ stuff, regarding your stance in this case. People are more comfortable in their echo chambers. Um, And if you are a person that has come outside of your your, your chamber and you've looked at all the information and you're still on the side of, well, no, I still think they're innocent, I have mad respect for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I know differently, maybe because I know a little bit more and I've been involved for a little bit longer. Um, But um, I still respect it. I still have mad respect for people who are able to. But when you shut out information because you want to have blind faith in what you believe in, I don't have any respect for that. I don't have any time for it. I don't have any tolerance for it. I will block, block, block those people because they just can't. You're not going to change their minds. Mm -hmm. And that's that's regarding a lot of things. LGBTQ people set in their mind about it. I don't, I'm not I'm not trying to reach your mind. I'm trying to reach the mind of the 11-year-old who's questioning their sexuality and I want them to know that this is a safe place for them to live. If your mind is still there, I don't have time for you. Um, and so, and that's kind of what my mindset is and maybe that comes with age. I used to want to change the world and I don't want to anymore. <laughs> um, and so, when it comes to this particular case, I'm only talking to you. Mm-hmm. I'm talking to a couple of other people about it, um, um, possibly. Um, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go out of my way to try to change anybody's minds. You look at the information, look at it from both sides, and come to your own conclusion. Um, but he's guilty. <laughs> but 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 he's guilty. Um, you know he did it. He um, here's the scenario. Um, she had come to his house several times, um, and he fancied her. He decided to take a shot on uh, October 10th. And showed up on a towel uh, and made his moves and made a comment to her about the bulletin board that he had on the wall with the women he'd slept with and told her she was going to be on that wall someday. Uh, and it creeped her out. She told a few people about it. Multiple people. Multiple people about it. And then he decided to get her out there one more time. Make sure you send that photographer you sent last time. Used a fake name. Yep. Used um, his sister's name. Not even her full name. Mm-hmm. B. Janda. Um, used that her trailer's address, sold a van she did not want to sell. She was saving it for her sons. There was a brand new seat that was going to be installed in that van sitting outside the van. Um, Teresa came out, took the pictures. He made a move. She didn't accept. Um, and the rest is questionable. I think part of Brendan's confession is bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a chunk of it is true. I think he was fishing for answers. I think there's an underlying deep thing that Brendan has not confessed to yet that's so horrific in his mind that it, he went on a, an expedition just throwing them information. Well, it makes sense. I mean, even his family, the reason they questioned him in the first place was like, wow, why are you losing so much weight? He there's, doing, there's a secret there. Stuff. There's a secret yeah. there. Um, and I don't know what it is. Um, I have ideas Mm -hmm. of what it might be. Um, It's possible that he was the one that shot her because Mm -hmm. Stephen asked him to. Yeah. And he doesn't want to admit that. Um, It's possible that when he raped her, she was already dead Mm -hmm. because Stephen has a propensity to grab women by the throat and strangle them so he could have strangled her out before um, all this even occurred. There's some underlying deep, dark ugliness, and I, I share that view with a lot of the investigators a lot of the people involved in this case, we all know that there's some thing that Brendan did not tell us. So some of the other shit is garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, so whatever happened in that trailer, what happened in the garage, what happened, um, I don't know. What I do know is that when she wasn't showing up at his property, he used star 67 to call her twice. Yeah. And he had never in the history of his cell phone records used star 67 before, but twice on that day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he used his regular yep. regular number after she was gone, probably as a way to say, hey, where are you? You never showed up. Um, Cover his tracks. Yep. There was a conversation between um, uh, Chuck and uh, Steve that Earl overheard regarding, hey, did that photographer ever show up? And Stephen said no. Mm-hmm. Well, eventually he discovered Bobby saw her. Mm-hmm. So he had to cop to the fact that she was there. But she never left the car. He never spoke to her. 
And then he came. She came to the trailer. She gave me money, or I gave her money, and she gave me the Auto Trader magazine. But she never came inside. Okay. You know, I mean, it was just the stories were super inconsistent. And then if you listen to those early jailhouse calls, if you've ever been manipulated by a man before mm -hmm. or a person before, there's a pattern of things that yep. they do. And so when they found, like for instance, when they found blood in the garage, um, suddenly he had a deer. Mm -hmm. There was a deer hanging in the garage. Do you remember that? And one after the other, people would say, no, I don't remember a deer. And then somebody would remember, oh, yeah, you did have that deer in there. And then he sold that story. Every single person he sold that story to because he's got one person that he found in his fishing expedition that's going to remember a deer. And he did that regarding the bullet. He did that regarding the gun. He did that regarding uh, the, the blood. He did that regarding uh, the cut on his finger. Um, he would find a person who would corroborate. He would, And then if it would stick then you would use that over and over and over again. If you listen to the jailhouse calls, if you can painfully go through the Wisconsin, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can do that, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> then you can listen to all these jailhouse calls and there's a mountain of information in there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, he, uh, he then decided to burn her body, whether that was before Brendan came over or Brendan helped, to, helped carry her to the fire, I'm not 100% certain. But when you look at the fire pit evidence or read the fire pit evidence, there are calcine bones in the center, there are charred bones on the outside that have popped out of the fire, and there are burnt tools laying all the way around the fireplace. Which they said nothing about in they, the yeah. murder. Um, and I mean, if you listen to Brendan's testimony, he, you know, he tells how he broke her apart using those tools. Mm -hmm. He tells how he, they're all charred. He'd never used that fire pit. Everybody on the property would say he didn't have regular fires there. He never used that fire pit. For weeks, he lied about the fact that he never had a fire there on that night. And then suddenly, somebody says there was a fire there. Oh, yeah, I had a fire there. But he never mentions Brendan until Brendan confesses. And then he sells that story. Oh, yeah, remember I told you Brendan was with me. No, you never, you never told me Brendan was with you at this fire. And so his story is constantly changing. And, and once you see the pattern, it's, un, it's impossible not to see it. I equate it to those 3D puzzles from the 90s, those ridiculous pictures that look like nothing but a whole bunch of colors, and you stare at them long enough or cross-eyed and tilt your head, and the 3D image pops out. You see those? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm yep, talking about? Yep. They stare, the one guy stares at one in front in mall rats for like hours, and he can never see the, the sailboat pop up. Mm -hmm. Once you see it pop up, you go back and you look at it again, and it's easy to do it. And that's what this case looks like to me. I looked at it cross-eyed for a long time and I just could not see it and then when I did it was I, I can't unsee it it's they're so unbelievably guilty um, anyway so the charred bits of bone are all around the fire pit the calcine bones are in the center some of those bones are missing um, and uh, were buried in various areas according to Brendan um, but once I saw those pictures once I saw actual bone embedded in burnt tire um, and what he had done is he'd thrown five or six tires on there as an accelerant. The brand new seat for the van mm -hmm. that he was just trying to sell, he burns. If you're trying to sell the van, yeah, why would why you burn you the seat? It? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a myriad of other things that he threw on there. A cabinet that Barb had gotten as a gift from somebody just weeks before um, because it was outside still and was wooden. He threw it on there. He threw everything he possibly could to accelerate that fire and get it to burn as quickly as possible. No explanation for that. <laughs> why do you yeah. just why do you just run around on a Halloween night burning everything, including new stuff, um, just for fun when you've never had a fire out there before? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it's obvious to me. It is. But. Yeah, there's a lot. I just hope that with this interview and anyone listening to this, like I said I'm not trying to change your mind. I want you to kind of look at this and look at every case with an you know open eyes and really look at this as look at the evidence in it and try to learn from this and try not to trust everything you hear because <laughs> that's really really important especially when it comes to so much true crimes documentaries out now there's so many podcasts even like mine even though mine's a little bit different because it's not necessarily true crime there's true crime in it but it's right just weird stuff. Weird. The weird good, stuff the good stuff the good stuff but even when i we just did a jump I just did John Bonet 
I did not watch or did not listen to the John Bonet one yet. I had I did s- listen to the one about your father. Yeah. And true to my super sleuthy nature, mm-hmm. I have screenshots <laughs> and information yeah. and links and stuff like that that I've been following since yeah. trying to find information, but you're right. There's a lot of dead end stuff there where it just yeah. like stops and it's like Well, and people are homeless and have been yeah. homeless for so long. You know, you don't necessarily have bank accounts. You don't necessarily, yeah. you know, you go get your check cash if you get from social security at the check cashing place. You right. know, you don't have an address. Um even the addresses that are for my I don't even like calling her stepmom, my dad's wife. Ex. Uh I mean, it's shelters, some of them, and I call them, and they can't legally give information, which is fine, because that's to keep their residents safe. Sure. Um, Because a lot of them are from abuse situations, stuff like that, but yeah, completely incomplete. Yeah. But like with John Bonet, I had so many people, like, this wasn't fact, this wasn't right, this wasn't, you know, people who really love that case, and I understand that's a big case, and so many people follow it. But I was just stating, like, facts, and I actually just read it from, like, the police reports. And I'm like, this is from the police report. This is from yep. this. But if you're like, that's wrong, I'm like, I'm not saying what's wrong or right. <laughs> so right. You know, so it's just, you know, I probably saw it on a documentary or saw it on a movie or something like that. Just, like, I saw stuff in Making a Murder, and so I'm like, okay, the police are crooked and stuff yeah. like that. You know, it's just like your mind just automatically goes there. So the but, funny part about yeah. the police being crooked mm-hmm. in Manitowoc. Okay, a couple of things. I was going to ask about that, yeah. It's a really amazing. small town. Yep. They had limited resources. They literally need, this is a big case. Mm-hmm. This is a big murder. This is a big, you know, uh, this is not something that they see on a regular basis. Um, it was a hot week for Manitowoc. There was another girl that um, the around the same age, there was actually a, a conspiracy theory around this. She died of um, uh, overdose. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a speculation, Carmen Boutwell was her name. Um, there was speculation at the time because her mother did not get her remains back for a long period of time. That somebody in the police department had actually stolen her remains and dumped those in Stephen Avery's. And those were just, those weren't even Teresa's bones. That she was alive somewhere yeah. and that they staged this entire thing oh, and it was really? a hoax. And the bones in there were actually Carmen Boutwell's. Um, anyway, there were other things that were going on. There was an assault um, against um, a wife. A man had taken an axe to her, and then people were like, oh, but this guy was also seen in the Avery property at one point in time. Lots of people have been seen in the mm-hmm. Avery property. It is the auto salvage shop. This is where people go to ditch their cars, buy car parts, swap things out, yada, yada. And so, but because he had axed his wife and he'd been on the Avery property, he must have been on the Avery property and killed Teresa. I mean, just these theories mm-hmm. that just like, but it was kind of a hot week um, for for crime in Manitowoc and in the surrounding areas. And so they needed to pool in every resource that they possibly could um, because there, there aren't a lot. You see the same names of these officers all over the place because there's that's a handful the officers of, that are there. That's yeah. a, there's a handful of officers. A lot of these people were called in um, off duty. Um, and it's a small community. People talk in a small community, and there is a little bit of infighting within the law enforcement department. Um, If there was this massive conspiracy and this massive frame-up and cover-up, somebody would have talked about it by now. Mm -hmm. Somebody would have said something. Somebody would have gone after somebody's job, or there would have been other discrepancies in their records, other times where they were accused of framing somebody or accused of doing this or you know they're in an inexperienced department so they made a lot of mistakes some of those mistakes may warrant a new trial they're not perfect human beings um but this is not a big conspiracy this is not a big cover-up somebody would have talked about it somebody would have lost their job somebody would have went into hiding and moved away somebody you know i mean there's a myriad of things that would have happened especially with i mean even the call i mean these these police officers and um, a lot of the lawyers are getting calls with threats to their family. Um, there, it's been a huge backlash since Making a Murderer came out. You think that I would? I mean, even if I was completely innocent and did everything correct at my job, I'd want to protect my family. I'd probably run, especially if I, the things they were saying were true. <laughs> I, it would be terrifying. Andy Colburn probably took Ken Kratz, Andy Colburn, Tom Fossbender, Weger. Um, Link took the biggest heat, hit heat obviously, mm-hmm. but arguably Andy Colburn um, took the biggest mm-hmm. because of that stupid license plate. Yeah. Um, and in reality, somebody called him and said, hey, be on the lookout for this license plate because this woman is missing. She was just a missing person at the time. 
and he grabbed a notepad and he wrote it down while he was driving. He called back to confirm that what he wrote down was the correct number because he couldn't read his writing. And that was, was one that looked huge. And that was and that it was yeah. as simple as that. And then when they finally were able to triangulate exactly where he was based on timestamp, when he mm-hmm. made that phone call to call the plate, he was in a church parking lot. So unless that vehicle was sitting in the church parking lot with him, he was absolutely not in front of the vehicle and did not know where the vehicle was. And it's that cut and dry. And there are still supporters to this day saying, nope, don't believe it. <laughs> like, are you kidding? There's a timestamp. He was literally at the church parking lot, 922, when that phone call was made, just to simply confirm um, and because you making a murder took a couple of edits of him looking nervous when he was actually in an intermission during court where he was bored. He was sitting up there for 15 yep, and you minutes. can see that making a murder did a great job at that of taking him clips from shady. things that were not even their responses and putting that yep putting that in there him just like a reality holding his r- rubbing his hands yeah. like this and shifting in his chair. That was during a 15 minute period of time where nobody was asking a question. He was sitting on the stand with nothing to do. What do you feel about the key? key situation i know that ken kratz in documentary like he even said like oh i knew when i heard that he's like yeah this oh, key fuck. is gonna screw my case up. <laughs> yeah um it, you know and it's true but i mean people need to stop using the narrative that they found it on the seventh search mm-hmm. first of all and i've talked to i've talked to a lot of these people i've talked to fossbender i've talked to weaker i've talked to michael grisbach i've talked to um in email andy colburn um i've talked to a lot of these people um, and I've actually, I've actually sat down and spent some time with these people. The consensus was as soon as her, her, her last stop was Avery property, everybody was like, oh, God, no. Yeah. You know, they, they wanted nothing to do with this. Well, why would you? I could imagine. Because they knew, they knew what Avery had, you know, like that lawsuit towards the city. Yep. I could imagine. He was high profile. Yeah. He was being touted around by the governor. They were naming bills after him. Mm-hmm. They were like, please don't let this be the Averys. And when they found the vehicle, that just compounded it. It was just like... They didn't know what they were dealing with, and they had to they had to handle it with kid gloves as much as they possibly could. But they also needed all their resources, and so it's unfortunate that Manitowoc officers are the ones that found the primary evidence. Um, and at first, um, I was okay with the majority of the evidence, even when I thought he was guilty. But that key, that key, was just like the hardest thing ever. Um, we have located a uh, it's an it's a record. Um, mm-hmm cabinet is what it is that cabinet that end table isn't really an end table it's a place to store your al- your records mm-hmm. your albums yeah. from like the 1960s and 1970s it is very very possible that it was in the back in between that panel mm-hmm. and that in that section and when they were shoving things around and shoving the pornograph ba- porn- pornography back in that cabinet that they lodged it loose um, could I reenact it no well, even the cops were saying, a lot of people were saying the reason it was planted was because, you know, the cops said, well, we were shaking, you know, shaking, cleaning stuff up, and then they didn't see it, and it could have fell out during that, which total, totally it's, can. It's possible. But they're showing, like, the change on top of there, where the, here's the first picture, and the change is exactly yeah. in the same spot. Yeah. It's something where, again, if they, I'm calling, I just want them to redo the case. And they yeah. can even take that out if they want, because sure. who cares if about If you took the key out he'd still be convicted. That's yeah. the bottom line. If you took the key out, he'd still be convicted. There's, there's The key matters. Mm-hmm. It actually just caused a complication. It I did. wish they wouldn't have found the key, honestly. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and it wasn't seven searches. Um, they did a quick overview of the place the first day. Because keep in mind, they don't want to look like they're targeting Avery. They don't want Avery to be involved in this at all in the first place. So in in actuality, if it had been somebody else, they probably would have turned that entire place upside down the first day. Mm -hmm. But they kind of handled it with kid gloves. And so they would go and they would talk and they would say, okay, well, we need the vacuum cleaner and the carpet cleaner. So they would go in and get those things and leave. Not a search. Listed as a search, but not a search. They were literally there to get evidence to test. And then the next time, you know, I need you to go in and get the computer. And then they would go in and they would get the computer and they would leave. They were there to, to retrieve some things and not actually do a search. Um, if she was supposed to be murdered on the bed, even if they did pull off the sheets and wash them, why didn't they send the mattress to the lab? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, why was the guy in the search of the bedroom sitting on the, what could potentially be a crime scene, taking notes and looking around? I mean, there's a lot of mistakes they made. Mm-hmm. They screwed up royally a lot Again. of things. Uh, but that doesn't take from the fact that he's guilty. Yeah. Um, I mean, do I believe they planted things? No. Do I uh, believe that they were dumb and, and didn't do you know as good a job as maybe a big city 
homicide department mm-hmm. would be? Yes. But all of those officers have exemplary records. Andy Colburn has been called twice by two different people to me, uh, the Barney Fife of Manitowoc. Not the sharpest knife in the drawer and certainly the kindest. Um, when he did that report on the phone call he took as a jail clerk in 1980, no, 19, I can't remember what year, he took that call saying, hey, you might have somebody in jail um, that's innocent because mm-hmm. I got this guy in jail who says he did it or, or yeah. whatever. Nobody said Teresa's name. Nobody said Stephen Avery's name. Nobody said anything other than an assault. It, it doesn't even say sexual assault. Mm-hmm. It just says an assault. And so his integrity pushed him to create a report years later because he happened to recall that phone call. Nobody told him to make a report. Mm-hmm. Nobody. He talked to Link about it, and Link said, yeah, maybe we write something up just to be in the safe side. He didn't have to, and if he didn't, nobody would even know that phone call even existed. He did it because he is an honorable man. He is an honest man, probably too honest. Um, and so seeing him take the brunt of a lot of this um, as soon as I realized that was really hard because one of his daughters had to drop out of college. One of his daughters had to change their name. Um, He, in court, said, this did not cause my divorce. I had an Mm -hmm. affair. But Mm -hmm. the reality is he probably had the affair because of making... I mean, you know, I'm not trying to excuse his behavior. It doesn't help your mind. it, 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 uh, It... it diminished his capacity to do his job, to be a good husband, to take mm-hmm. care of his kids. Um, he had people threatening to snipe him from rooftops. Yeah. How do you even go to work each day without an, an unbelievable amount of anxiety, just making it through your day? Am I going to live today? Are my kids going to live today? Is my wife going to live today? Over edits in a documentary. Um, and that, yeah, that Do you think me. they'll ever apologize or admit no. of the wrongdoing? Nope, they've been confronted several times, and in every interview, they're like, meh, you know, we did our job, we made a documentary. It's not our job to decide whether he's guilty or not. That's up to you guys to decide, you know. <laughs> it's I mean, a really interesting combo. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, okay. I mean, and they'll they'll say, we were crunched for time, we had to do this, and we had to do that, and everybody edits their documentaries, and we didn't do anything that, you know, um, everybody else doesn't do. Uh, but the truth is that they've exhausted all of their insurance funds, like $3 million because of lawsuits. Yeah. They lost their $3 million house that they bought together. Um, you know, they 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 have not produced another documentary that has garnered anything. I don't think they've even produced another documentary with the exception of Making a Murder 2. Are you involved at all with anybody now from the Avery family? I am. Okay. Yep. You were, you were at Jets Memorial. Yep. So was Carla, Stephen's niece. Oh, okay. And, and their family. Okay. Um, but yes, uh, Earl and mm-hmm. I just had a discussion not too long ago. I sent mm-hmm. him a message saying, hey, how are you holding up? He goes, actually, it's been pretty quiet here so far. Yeah. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> are they, do they want Avery out? No. You, yeah. It's probably terrifying. Uh, Carla, Carla still will stand by the fact that he's innocent because oh, she created okay. the family group. Um, and I'm not going to speak for you, Carla. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I think she... I personally think she knows. Sure. Um, and just and just hasn't acknowledged it or let it in. Or I know the last update, and you probably know more than me, I saw the last update was in August. It looks like that they denied uh, Kathleen's information that she sent to trying to get him a new case. Yeah. As of now. Um, it, do you think, she, has she put anything out that you know of? Anything no, else? No, both of them are at dead ends. Yeah. So this might the only be- the only hope Brendan has right now is mm-hmm. to take an Alfred plea. Yeah. Um, and it's my understanding if he were to go to an attorney and say he wants one, that it would be offered to him in no time. Really? These officers did not want to send a 16-year-old to prison. Especially if, I, as much as even... And I don't want to say this because I don't want to say anything against Teresa's family. I think that their opinion should be very much valid and out there of what they would like for justice for their child. But, I mean, if you can look at Brendan, even if he did the things fully that he said he did... It is a child mm-hmm. that was manipulated. And I don't know it, that Hallbox would ever um, mm-hmm. give an opinion. They have been pretty tight-lipped about mm-hmm. all of this. There's a few family members that have come forward, cousins, things yeah. like that, that have spoken on their behalf. Um, I want all of this to die for them. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, my, I guess my biggest concern about convicting a murderer coming out 
aside from telling the truth mm-hmm. and upholding the integrity of documentaries, is that it would cause that family more pain. Yeah. Um, because the discussions would be resurrected again and people would be talking about it again and going back and forth about it. How do you function online at all? Mike, her brother, is, um, uh, works for the Green Bay Packers. So, I mean, it's literally his job to do PR and be in the front of everything. How do you do your job like that in the face of, you know, um, and then you know have to deal with this stuff. Be looked at the, as the brother of the girl who's constantly talked about all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, her parents stay pretty secluded and quiet. Um, some of the people in this documentary are, are, have had conversations with them. Um, they just want nothing to do with any of this. And so I don't know that they would even have an opinion, honestly, mm-hmm. if Brendan wanted an Alfred plea. Um, it's never going to happen, and it's never going to happen because of making a murder. Yeah. Um, at one point in time before making a murderer, if he had attorneys who came to him and said, you have an op- opportunity to get out of prison right now mm-hmm. if you take an Alfred plea, um, I think he would have done it. Making a murderer made him a star. Mm-hmm. He has attention and friends and people gifting him things and filling his commissary. Huge support. He never had that even when he was out. He never had that kind of support. Mm-hmm. He never had that kind of love. Um, and he has it in spades now. People who call him and check in on him and write him and love him. Um, how do you how do you mm-hmm. tell everybody? Yeah. Actually, I did it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so he's going to sit there until his sentence is done, which I, th- I believe is forty eight. Two thousand forty eight. Yeah. Okay. And then Stephen has obviously life. Yeah, Stephen's not going anywhere. And if you take a look at Stephen's pictures, his fail, his his health is failing. He's mm-hmm. I don't I don't know that he's going to live much longer. I take a look at him and I just in the last five years he's well prison he, ages you. He does not look well yeah. at all. Um, <coughs> let's see if we can look up Brendan's release. Mm-hmm. Um, but he could be out right now. Um, but he's got attorneys who are loving the attention and the tours. Earliest possibility of parole for Brendan is 2048, and that's not even a guarantee. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was 16, for yeah. crying out loud. He was offered a 15-year plea, and if you go back through those jail calls, mm-hmm. even his own mother is advising him against it and wants him to roll the dice and take his chance in court, given all of the evidence that was against them. Mm-hmm. Um they probably believed they would see who he was as a person and thought, oh, no one no one in their right mind would do yeah. this or not see him as a victim. It actually is really sad. It is. It is sad what Stephen has done to that family. And you can hear it. I mean, even in, I mean, making a murderer, like you said, they make him look like a big teddy bear. And like you said, just because someone's a piece of shit doesn't mean they murdered somebody, right? But you can really see if you listen to the unedited phone calls, he really does manipulate that family. And it's really too bad. And I hope that everyone listening really does that before placing an opinion. Even though I know this case is so big, everyone listening to this probably already has an opinion. There's very few people that haven't seen that documentary. But I do, I say do your own research. You can obviously watch Convicting a Murderer. It's my understanding that after Daily Wire, Mm -hmm. and we touched on it briefly, but um, when I I heard back in the day, there was a lot of prominent people that were vying for it and bidding for it. Mm Mm-hmm. What I didn't understand is those are just conversations being had, and ultimately because of the Netflix um, lawsuit, people didn't want to touch it because it would have been genius for Netflix to take this. It would have been because genius. Then obviously we're not biased because we're willing to show both sides, yeah. right? Um, but they were still in the middle of a lawsuit. They did win their lawsuit. Andy Colburn didn't win, which I to this day will never completely understand, especially given the actual blatant edits that were mm-hmm. done against him. Um, but he didn't win, um, and so Netflix wouldn't have lost anything by taking it, um, and it probably would have made a lot of money. The bottom line is, is Daily Wire was one of the only ones that was eager to take it, because um, they're a controversial streaming mm-hmm. service to begin with. And Candace Wire, or Candace Wire, Candace Owens is on a mission to show how media turns uh, villains into heroes, um, and so this aligned with what she was already trying to do um, on April twenty first when they announced that Daily Wire was taking it and Candace Owens was going to be cut into it, I just, my heart died. Yeah. I was like, first of all, this is going to limit our audience. 100%. Even though the first two episodes are on YouTube, you can watch those for free. They did do that, and there's been millions of views already. 
But after that, I mean, you want to see the rest of it. And if you're going to do your subscription, do it now. The last episode is October 26th, and at least you're only paying for one month subscription, and then you and can bail out. And share it with friends. That's and then what share I'm with doing. Her, and then just bail on it. Um, another thing that made me sick to my stomach is they knew that this was going to be high profile. Mm-hmm. They knew people were going to want to see the other side, and so this was their way of gaining more viewers to the mm-hmm. other garbage that they have on there. Um like what is a woman which is completely anti anti transgender mm-hmm. dialogue about you know um and there's a few other things i don't really want my friends and family exposed to this kind of stuff um and well, so even my my friend she's watching it on um some families tv and the family's kind of you know like kind of everything they hear is true so she's like i'm trying to get it off their tv as soon as i'm done yeah because i don't want yeah. them you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, not that i'm ever trying to keep anything from anybody you should watch what you want believe what you want but it's a lot of biased stuff there There are a lot of people not watching this because it's a Candace Owens documentary and the thing that bothers me is all of the marketing stuff and all like Candace Owens uncovers the truth and Candace Owens and she didn't come into it till right at the end no she's being fed the dialogue and the research and she's regurgitating it on things and yes she's done her research and it's my understanding um, after speaking to Brenda um, that, cause, cause, uh, shout out to Brenda Schuler. That woman dedicated an unruly amount of time and, and energy and files, extended herself to both sides mm-hmm. um, for years. This is a Brenda Schuler documentary. Yeah, I do hope that um, everyone, it's something that people do watch and try to get past, depending on your political or your feelings towards Candace Owen. Yeah. Try to get, try to get past that. She's not in it that much. It's, I and she's behaving. That. She's doing a great job. There's a little I'll bit of a race up. dig at one point in time and then a little bit of a dig at the Me Too movement. Yeah. <laughs> but but for the most part, she's staying factual. She's staying on track. She she's is. empathetic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I and, and truth be told, I don't hate Candace mm-hmm. Owens. Um, she's intelligent. Yeah. And some of the points that she makes... I can actually agree with and align with. It's the way she executes them. It's the way she says them with a complete disregard for humanity and, and other people or how her words or actions affect other people. A lot of what she says, I don't I don't agree with. Um, you know, if she ever becomes president, I probably will just die. <laughs> <laughs> even the best people have a bad side. Yeah. And even the worst people have a good side. We always kind of, even like making a murder, he's perfect, he does nothing wrong, even like he didn't, even with the cat burning, yeah. even with all this, they try to, you know, make it look like, oh, he's a good guy, so we all, I have done terrible things, we all have, but you know, and we've all said things we didn't mean, or we have said things we mean that we go back on, and we feel, oh, I shouldn't have said that, so try to take her in there with a grain of salt, I think she is doing a great job in it, I am, like you said, there was a few digs, but don't base obviously the hard work that you've seen from people making this documentary on just one person. Right. For sure. Um, is there anything else you want to add that you think would be important for people to know? No, I mean, eventually it'll end up on another platform. I don't know how long. I mean, it can take years sometimes. White Boy is a documentary that Sean Reck did um, that Netflix recently picked up for two years. It's available on Netflix okay. if you want to watch another Sean Reck documentary that's mind-blowing. I think it's like an hour and 22 minutes. Um, but that thing was done like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so it could be 10 years from now before Convicting a Rooter is on another platform. It, it will eventually be. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, it's, it's pretty popular, so maybe it will go faster. Who, who knows? Yeah. Um, but um, it'll always be narrated by Candace Owens, regardless mm-hmm. of where, where it goes. Um, and so, because um, it's a Daily Wire production now. Um, but don't let that sway you from watching it, um, because... Uh, there's just an awful lot of vital information in there. A lot of people put a lot of good time and work into it. Um, part of me was like, I hope this isn't seen by too many people because I don't want to, you know what I mean? I don't want that negative attention. But now I'm like, now that I see how they're depicting me and it's not nearly as mm-hmm. <laughs> as crazy obsessed as I thought they might, um, and I see how fair it is. It's very fair. Uh, it's so fair. I mean, they, they the, the people they have on there are phenomenal yeah. on both sides of the fence. Um they are not straying. There's a million rabbit holes they could go, go down. Avery's are not poor. They have a boatload mm-hmm. of money. Um, there, there's some other allegations and things like that that were not discussed in making a murder that, that could be put on there. Um, there's some things that he's currently doing, sending to supporters and stuff like that, that they may or may not. There's a whole mountain of information. But their goal was to 
show what making a murderer left out, show how you were manipulated, um, and and stay in that realm. And they're doing a great job of doing it. It's an excellent documentary. I give them lots of credit. Anyway. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for your time. All right. That was uh, an amazing interview. I'm so glad we got that exclusive from her because, wow, like those were, it was full of bombshells. (laughs) It's unbelievable. Thank you, Christine, so much for um, doing that with me. I know that we kind of talked about how we met on there and also how I learned she was involved with the case. And it was pretty shocking that someone kind of close to you, you know, was that close to the case. Mm -hmm. Um, I had no idea. (laughs) No, and when I first met her, she was bound by an NDA. Mm -hmm. Um, So she kind of was giving me a little, but she couldn't really tell me much. She actually really respected that, so it was awesome, Christine. So it's been really nice that she has finally been able to open up and I can get all these fun little funky details. So a lot of the stuff that you all are hearing, I knew a lot of it. Um, One thing I do want to share, I know she was talking about Candace Owens and this documentary and being on Daily Wire. So they tried to have other networks take it. They tried to have Netflix, but Netflix was scared. HBO, Prime, everything like that. This is a documentary they've been working on for six years. Sadly, Daily Wire was one that was willing to finance and take it over. And they didn't do that till the end of last year. Yeah, it took a long if you can believe time. It. What sucks about it is because even on the, you know, front of this documentary, it's like, by Candace Owens, look at all this evidence that Candace Owens found. Mm -hmm. She didn't find any of this, but Sean Reich was the one that directed it, and he worked on this for many, many years, and his name's not really shown on there yeah, at all. Like, you can see it in the credits and stuff like that, but... I mean, Candace Owen was kind of just the talking points in the face of this. So if you are looking at this documentary and you don't want to see it because of her, just realize like this was made by some people who really tried to do their best. And it was just sadly a very political and controversial uh, streaming service that took it. Yeah. Yeah. It was their baby. It was definitely their baby. And they just cut her in at the last minute. So because that was that was my first thought, too, when you told me. Candace Owens mm-hmm. and Daily Wire. I was like, oh, what? Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I don't want to watch that shit. I know. <laughs> That's, I can only I imagine know. how many people have the same view. So it's good that they know what you're telling them now. So hopefully they can try to put that aside. I was even sad because um, when I was kind of looking up, um, just so I made sure I had the right names and spellings and everything, um, when I was looking up even um, convicting a murder on Wikipedia for that information, um, Wikipedia made it sound like this was made because it was showing pretty much that Black Lives Matter was a terrorist group and the liberal agenda and everything like that. And as you've watched, Nicole, mm-hmm. it is nothing like that. No, no. They like they almost just started the putting those words. <laughs> they're bringing the truth against the liberal uh, agenda. Uh, but no, the documentary is not like that at all. So it was like, oh, that's really strange. Just you just put Kana Owens' name on it, which she, again we talked about. She did an excellent job in it. I will give her credit for that. Mm-hmm. She's not saying anything yet that has been too crazy. She's been very factual. Yeah, she sucks, but she did good. She did good. Um, again, like Christine was saying, she's a smart lady. She didn't get to where she was because she's not smart. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing, <laughs> but it's weird seeing that. Like ah, just putting that on that. I would feel bad if I was a documentarian. Yeah. I would. It would suck. Yeah. But what are you supposed to do? I don't know. I'm kind of weird. I don't sell my soul to things. I'm not saying they sold their soul. Yeah. But I'm hoping that they they get a lot of money for it, for all the work that they did. And I hope it goes to another service. And I hope, hope, hope our listeners, if that is something that turns you away from it, don't turn away from it. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't have to turn away from it. You don't have to watch it. You can watch the first two on YouTube. And if you want to do your own research from there, please do. Yeah. And just re-listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. We'll try to do some exactly. of the work for you. Yeah. Did you change your mind when you started hearing all this? I would say that it was like, I wasn't full on the innocence train before, but I definitely hard left it over to the guilty train immediately. Like hard mm-hmm. left. Not quite a doubt in my mind now of his, of his guilt versus innocence. But again, my opinion after viewing the actual facts a lot of the facts that were covered up that were just glossed over um it kind of feels like waking up like you were fed this narrative and you're just waking up to find out oh that's not what it was like 
kind of reminds you almost like of the story of Thanksgiving, what teachers teach you in school. It's like absolutely yeah. not accurate and they leave out so much and you're glorifying this this group or this person when you shouldn't be. <laughs> it's fucking terrifying because we we should be able to trust documentaries. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of news news stations too. I mean, I'm I like to watch a lot of true crime. I watch a lot of like long crime on like YouTube and stuff like that. And it goes from like, oh, here's some facts maybe um, to any news station. I'll say so any news station doesn't matter political. Some might be a little bit more in this. And it's like, okay, let's hear these 10 people's opinion. Yeah. As in that's as if that's news Mm -hmm. or we look at news anchors and back in the day news anchors didn't have a political agenda yeah it was like this is the news you didn't know if it was republican democrat third party you didn't know that but now you know like you know everyone's opinion that's pretty much what it is it's like little reality tv shows and this these documentaries are coming out are like that it's a whole new whole new ball game yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, it's like it's a good reminder to keep up on cases because most of the time, like I said before, you never hear about them again, or they slip your memory and life just moves on. Um, and it's a great example of how well the human mind can just be swayed one way or another. Um, and this took over the entire world. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just hoping that this documentary teaches people to keep their thoughts in check, not believe everything you hear, take everything or take anything you know at face value, do your own research. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, you got to be more keen, more aware about what you're reading. Mm -hmm. Just don't, don't trust all the shit. Even if it's a simple Google search. I know so many people that believe fake news because they saw like an article thumbnail on Facebook and they didn't even click on it. They just saw that it was a title of an article and they just take it for a fact, you know? Well, it's almost like the, this was something that was genius and sorry, the comedian, he did a netflix special and he said hey what did everyone think about that pizza that was made that had like a nazi symbol on it did you guys hear about that and the audience was like huh and he's like raise your hand if you heard about this news story it was crazy and then like half the people in the audience raised their hand yeah and then he started pointing at people and was like what was your opinion on that do you think it was a nazi symbol and people were straight up like no i wasn't i think people are you yeah. know, it's taking things too seriously now, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, that wasn't a new story. I just completely just made just this up. Just made it up, yeah. Call him out immediately. Right there. Yeah. It is. It's crazy. It is. And even when I said this whole story, I'm like, don't, don't even listen to us. Yeah. Don't listen to us. Listen to your own facts. We're storytellers. Mm-hmm. Just, we're two friends. We're talking about cases just like you would a friend. We're storytellers. Mm-hmm. Don't believe me. Go out to it. And don't believe news stations a lot of the time because especially if they're using something from a documentary such as making a murder as their fact sheet and not the case Mm -hmm. yep look for as much official documentation as possible and i try my best and i think i i am 99.9 percent sure everything i said was fact but you know if i didn't that happens because i'm a human being Mm -hmm. we're human beings yep and also, like with Christine, which I give her a lot of mad respect for, because she does something that a lot of people don't. And it took her a little bit, but she did it. Is when you have this belief so much in your head, whether, like she said, whether it's a certain political belief, religious belief, belief in a case, anything like that, and you present a new evidence or something that challenges your viewpoint. Challenges your viewpoint. If you're not willing to look at it, that's pretty. You're not going to grow as a person. Mm-mm. You're just not going to grow as a person. Yeah, it's really irresponsible. It really is. Mm-hmm. It's fucking stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So. That was that was huge of her uh, mm-hmm. to just unlock that part of her brain, essentially, despite how fucking deep in she was. And the norm, yeah. you know, the normal person might just be like, God, I went so fucking far and all these people and I was out there and my face was out there and I'm going to look like an idiot. But like you got to move past it you have to and nothing's going to change if nobody does i'd rather look like an idiot than lie mm-hmm. be a fucking liar exactly yep you know i know your faults I, when people take accountability is like it's mm-hmm. it's one of my top traits of people and like mm-hmm. it, it took me honestly it took me a lot to get to to get there because i i you know as a youth i grew up I mean, like most kids, you you kind of want to place the blame on something else and you don't want to take accountability and maybe you'd get in trouble with your parents over that. Um, 
And it wasn't until my later years and like my career that I really started valuing accountability and how much other people value that. And it just kind of breaks that open and you're able to unlock that that side of you. And it, yeah, it takes a lot though. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm perfect. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> you need to take accountability for not being fucking perfect. I am perfect. <laughs> you take that yep. <laughs> so everyone should give a five star talking about how perfect we are and i want to hear nothing else nothing i swear i swear we change our opinion on this every episode we're like oh it went from like it went from i don't want to hear everything then last time it went from give us nice constructive criticism this time i'm like i want fucking nothing everything's <laughs> yeah. nice yeah there was definitely a point where you're like send us everything tell me you hate me no 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 like, oh god you can no. I told them they could send it by email. Send it by email. Send you hate me by email. By email. Girls gone weird. Email yeah. at gmail dot com is where the hate letters go. <laughs> yes, and send your booze and make sure to listen to the first three episodes if you haven't and get into our spooky contest. You have to the end of the month. Yes, we're getting there. We're already halfway into October, um, and we've had a good response. I feel like we've had enough response that I might go ahead and just call it right now that I might have a little runner up prize to send. So, but it's just oh on the edge, God. which means you have a very good shot at re- getting either of these these giveaway prizes because there there's not a ton. Get some free shit. There's, en- there's enough, so don't think that you're going to be outnumbered by everybody's entries. Like it's a mm-hmm. it's a good amount, but everybody's got a really fair shot, and that's if I don't keep it all for myself. Yeah, I want to keep everything too. I'm, I think we should just <laughs> we just should, and then tell like. It's kind of like the McMillions. I think I said that before where they were like one of the employees was keeping the million dollar pieces for himself. <laughs> yeah. Like that was a, he was keeping like he found out a way to take all the million dollars. And obviously he couldn't like himself like go into the rest yeah. restaurants and like claim yeah. it. So he would like give them to like friends yeah. or like family or like other people. Yeah. And then someone started researching like why is it all these family or friends of these yeah. people yeah. that are winning? this every you year you gotta start and hitting guy, reddit and spreading that shit out <laughs> i know <laughs> right no they did they tried and then they oh watch mcmillions it's a <laughs> fucking excellent documentary it's one of my favorites it's badass but we might make million this shit maybe i'll tell you <laughs> right like now a- i will be honest <laughs> little ghosty is on my desk at the moment until we give it away because i love it and i might need one for myself so it's getting all my I good juju to. before i send it off to you whoever you are Oh, and by the time this comes out, they got their bonus episode on Friday, too. Yes, our Friday 13th We're so episode. nice. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I That's my favorite episode so far. It is mine, too. I remember you asked me in the live what, mm-hmm. what my favorite was, and I was like, I can't say. Spoiler alert. It's that one. Mm-hmm. I had a good it time. Is. And you know what I realized? <laughs> our little game we played, mm-hmm. we, we didn't even, like, count, who, like, who was the winner and who was the loser. We just moved on. <laughs> that's because we downed a cocktail in like two minutes that's true we're like well the game's done like i don't even know who won we both sucked we both did really good at the beginning and then we just fucking petered out that's most drinking games isn't it it is (laughs) that's just how it's supposed to work and now i am just (laughs) kicking myself in the ass for not saying texas chainsaw massacre for tea Tea. (laughs) are you still going because i'll randomly like be watching a movie or something and then connect it to the game yeah yeah like like, i'm like oh this would have been good for that letter yeah (laughs) we'll have to redo this maybe next friday the 13th we'll redo this game and see if we've improved it maybe we could do like a live game maybe we could do a live and bring up two other people and we'll all play together that would be fun if you guys want to do that let us know yeah yeah (laughs) give us some feedback and share 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 Thank you for everyone continuing to listen. Yeah, it's been, it's it still has been such great uh, love and, and outpouring of, of support for us. So yeah. we appreciate it. It's been for fun sure. for us too. Good creative for outlet. Sure. This was one I was nervous about. Like I said, just because I'm like, oh, I hope this mm-hmm. doesn't take away the fun of it. But I feel like after we did it and everything, I feel good about it. I feel good about it. So yeah. Don't come at me, Steven supporters. It's good. It's and. <laughs> you're gonna get all the avery supporters at your door they're gonna be like um, i yeah. drove by your house and i see him <laughs> son of a bitch over there <laughs> i drove by your house <laughs> not son of a bitch over there you gotta work on your 
You got to work on your managed we walk. walk. Your managed walk. Your Cali Mac County accent. <laughs> we got to do, do better. I'm going to hold you I accountable will. for that terrible accent. <laughs> Perfect. So, <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. We love you. Until until next Sunday when we have our uh, our next episode coming out, episode seven. So, and I'm excited about it. It's right on my week of surgery, which I'll tell you guys about. So maybe I'll be a little fucked up during it. (laughs) 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 All right, weirdos, come get weird with us next Sunday, and we'll we'll catch you later. Bye. Bye. Until next time, this has been Nicole and Denny with Girls Gone Weird. (laughs) Girls Gone Weird.